to our council meetings. As the community can see, we are back in our council chambers. As the community can also see, the city councillors are sitting in different places. We don't have all of our city staff here. I want to take a minute to explain that. We have worked with Algoma Public Health to ensure that we could have our meetings in person again. And we've had Algoma Health, Public Health in the building and we have worked with them to make sure we followed a protocol. Uh, and so you'll see that protocol will have a number of our attendees attending virtually and you'll see that work tonight. And you'll also notice that not all of our staff are with us, but our staff are available to us and we'll be calling in. I wanted to point out that the city councillors are wearing their masks, notwithstanding the fact that they are physically distant from one another. Algoma Public Health asked us to do that as an example to the community. They'd like to normalize mask wearing inside. And so they've asked that during our council meeting, uh, even though we are physically distant, they ask that we wear our masks unless we are speaking. So you'll see the city councillors will have their masks on unless they are speaking. Um, and I asked the city councillors in accord with the Global Public Health advice that when you do touch your mask and where you're going to be taking your mask on and off, that you use the hand sanitizer that is at your desk. It's critically important that as a community, we continue to follow Goma Public Health's advice. We're seeing across the province of Ontario that numbers of COVID-19 are increasing and that could happen in Sault Ste. Marie. So we wanna make sure that we are setting an example to the community at large. You'll note that we do have members in the gallery tonight. We will not commonly have members in our gallery, uh, but tonight is a special occasion, which we have also cleared with Algoma Public Health. Uh, we have renamed the Civic Center, the Ronald A. Irwin Civic Center, and he is here tonight with his family uh, to address council in the city. So we met with Algoma Public Health about that event also and made sure that we were doing that event in accord with proper public health uh, principles. So before we start tonight's meeting, I wanted to give Councillor Hollingsworth an opportunity to speak because she asked me if she could convey one message to the community. Councillor Hollingsworth. Thank you. I'm just taking off my mask. Just give me one moment. I just want to um, basically say thank you to our educators and our community in the surrounding area. We as council would like to take a few minutes to say again thank you to our educators, including our child care centers, our child care helpers, teachers, teachers assistants, school board, cleaning, maintenance, cleaning staff, maintenance staff, administration, bus drivers, school guards, and so forth. Sorry if we have missed one or two. It takes many people to ensure that our children are safe, especially during these times. We know that prep by all doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen within one day. Before the school year started, before this time has presented itself, I know many, many of you have gone out of your way to make sure that the classroom is safe, to make sure our buses are clean, to make sure our childcare centers are clean. I know that you took your own precious time away from your families to make sure other families are going to be safe. We also recognize that the process obviously has changed. It has not changed weekly or monthly. It's been changing daily and sometimes hourly. Please recognize that we understand that you have been flexible. Please understand that you have taken a lot more time to prepare for this unique year. You become adaptive. You, we do recognize you have gone beyond your normal duties. There are many, many examples of teachers, maintenance staff, bus drivers, and so forth that have gone out of their way. Tonight, I'd like to give you two quick examples. One, a teacher, Ms. Lil Kangas. She teaches grade two and grade three and a school, I believe it's at Parkland. She, during the whole summer, went ahead and made masks for every child in her school. Not her classroom, for every child. That's all the grades. And she actually color coordinated. So grade six would have a particular color, grade four would have green, grade two would have purple, and so forth. She did, did this on her own time, her own money. Isn't that incredible? because she wanted to make sure everyone was safe. Another teacher, 
Another teacher is practicing teaching outside, and hence they went ahead during the summer and got Tupperware containers, large ones, and all the materials that kids needed would be put in these large containers, clean, and the children could sit on them as they are taught outside in our beautiful community. In closing, I also want to recognize Ms. Lou Reese. Everyone, including herself, her team at the boards, all boards, Catholic boards, French, and so forth, everyone has been helping our children with a very warm touch heart to make sure every again everyone's safe. So thank you. Let's give our educators at all our boards a round of applause because what we're facing right now is obviously very different and unique. To our educators, to everyone, thank you very much. I applaud you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hollingsworth. Madam Clerk, if we could start the meeting, please. Under agenda item one, I have a motion by Councillor Scott and Bezel Allen resolved that the minutes of regular council meeting of August 10, 2020 be approved. All in favor. Carried. And under agenda item three, declaration of pecuniary interest, Councillor Shoemaker has declared a conflict with respect to agenda item 6.14, Algoma Central Railway property acquisition as the property owner is a client of his law firm and also with the associated bylaw 2020-164 and uh, with respect to uh, the zoning application at 1765 Great Northern Road, the applicant is a client of the law firm and he's also declared that conflict with respect to the associated bylaw 2020-175. And Councillor Gardy has declared a conflict with respect to agenda item 6.7, the Millennium Court Ravine remedial work, as he is the owner of property in the immediate vicinity. <coughs> and those are all of the declarations that I've received. Any other conflicts, Council? Seeing none. And I have a motion by Councillors Guardian and Vezo Allen resolved that the agenda for September 14, 2020 City Council meeting as presented be approved. All in favor. Motions carried. That brings us to 5.1, the Ronald A. Irwin Civic Center dedication. I want to wish everybody a good afternoon and thank you all for being with us today. I want to thank all of Ron's family who has made the effort to be here with him and Mark today. I want to begin by thanking the community members who sent Council and myself a letter in August of 2019 suggesting that the City find an appropriate way of recognizing Ron Irwin's public service. Specifically, I want to recognize and thank Peter Nixon, Frank Caputo, Terry Rinoni, Jim McCauley, Bob Davies, David Orzetti, and Cecilia Ross. If this were a different time, we would have invited all of them here to share in today's celebration. As it is, we were not able to. The city has to ensure that we set example, and to do so, we made sure that today's event complied with all of Algoma Public Health's recommendations. To that same end, I want to thank the Irwin family for its patience and its understanding. I know that there were many more people that they would have liked to invite to and include in today's celebration. I want to recognize and thank my friends and colleagues that served on the Council Committee that made the recommendation to name City Hall the Ronald A. Irwin Civic Center. Councillor Gardy, Councillor Hillsinger, Councillor Shoemaker, and former City Alderman Arthur Galazzi. I know I can speak for Councillors Gardy, Hillsinger, and Shoemaker when I say that Alderman Galazzi was the favorite member of the committee. <laughs> he brought a history and an energy to the committee that we all enjoyed. He helped make our decision very clear while providing a tremendous example of kindness and collegiality. Art. Today is Ron's day, so I have to be careful that I do not go on too much about you. But I will say this, you are a gentleman, a gentleman who very clearly loves his community and has given a lot to it. Thank you for your service and your friendship with your city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ronald A. Irwin was born in Sault Ste. Marie on October 29th, 1936. He grew up in the city's West End attended elementary and high school here in Sault Ste. Marie. Ron received his undergraduate degree from the University of Western Ontario and his law degree from Osgoode Hall Law School. 
Ron served our community as a school board trustee from 1966 to 1968, an alderman from 1969 to 1971, and as our mayor from 1972 to 1974. Ron was first elected as a member of parliament in 1980 and served in that capacity until 1984. During that time, he also served as the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Justice. Ron was re-elected as a member of parliament in the 1993 federal election and served in that capacity until 1997. During that time, Ron served on the Privy Council as the Minister of Indian Affairs and Northern Development. Ron retired from Parliament in 1997, and he served as a personal advisor to Prime Minister Kretchen from 1997 to 1998. Ron was appointed Canada's ambassador to Ireland in 1998, and he held that position until 2001. In 2001, Ron was appointed as Canada's Consul General to Boston. He retired from that position in 2005 and returned home to Sault Ste. Marie. Ron received the Order of Canada in 1975, the year I was born, and the Medal of Merit, our city's highest honor, in 1999. This is an impressive record of service, no doubt, and it was accomplished by Ron in large part due to the strength and determination of his character, but it was not possible with the, without the support and the commitment of his family. <clears throat> Those of us who serve in these positions know that while we may assume them independently, we do not occupy them alone. We bring our family along with us, and as a result, they carry part of the load. Marg, <clears throat> especially Marg, Brady, Nicole, and Tony, thank you. Thank you for your husband and father's record of service and for making the sacrifices that each of you have in order to make it possible. You all know that I know Ron well. It is my personal impression that of all his many accomplishments, his family is the source of his greatest pride. <clears throat> Ron, today is your day, a day long in the works and a day well deserved. I want to leave you with, and the community, with one final thought before you speak, which I hope you will take as high as a compliment as it is intended. No matter where you were or what capacity you were serving in, a trustee, an alderman, a mayor, a member of parliament, a cabinet minister, prime ministerial advisor, an ambassador, a consul general, you never forgot who you were or where you were from. You never forgot who sent you. <clears throat> you were born and raised in the west end of Sault Ste. Marie and you brought that with you wherever you went. You brought it with you proudly, and you represented the best qualities of our community, qualities that we have to draw, we've had to draw on our past, and qualities we will most certainly again have to draw on in our future. Hardworking, resilient, and determined. I can think of no better qualities to be associated with our city hall. And I thank you as mayor, on behalf of your community, for your leadership, your service, and your example. Thank you. I now invite you on to uh, say a few words to the community. I think we, you're gonna have to wait a minute because someone's coming up here. I think your son-in-law's coming up here to press uh, record on the camera he's got in front of me. Mr. Mayor, it's a long time since I've had a chance to address anybody in this council chamber. You know, I want to thank council, the committee, you, the people who see me for this opportunity. I want to thank my son and my, my two daughters for bringing the families here and for what, all they did getting ready for today. But there's one special thanks. That's my wife, Mark. I don't know how she lasted 60 years with me. I have no idea, but she did. Caring, always supportive. She was the anchor of the family, anchor of the family. Without her, I would have detoured long ago. She doesn't like me talking to her. Matt, is she giving me the Molokias or can I turn? I got the Molokias? I got the Molokias. <laughs> anyway, thank you for the opportunity. 
The Irwins, I'm not the only Irwin that has been here. Five of us on the, in the family, in my immediate family, served on city council. Uh, my great-grandfather, an Irish uh, immigrant, uh, councilman, uh, two mayors, five aldermen, my son Brady, the last one. And uh, we didn't do it to set a record. We just did, did it because we really enjoyed it. This was the most fun we ever had in politics. It was right here in, in this city. The... Uh, I mean, I had a curve. You mentioned the West End. I had a curve when I was very young. My mother was involved in accidents. I was moved up with my grandmother in the West End. She spoke no English, very little English. My grandfather, uh, Camilo, was killed in the, the steel plant in an industrial accident a year after I moved up there. And my mother stayed in the, in the, in the East End. And uh, the West End was an Italian community. We had nine grocery stores. Everybody spoke Italian. The immigrants spoke Italian. Their first-generation kids spoke Italian. Everybody spoke Italian. It was like an oasis. They once asked my daughter, my granddaughter Camille, where is she? Up there. They asked her once, what's your family heritage? And she said, we're mostly Irish, some German, but don't tell my grandpa he thinks he's Italian. <laughs> anyway, I went up as mayor, and as I indicated to you downstairs, I'm the first mayor that wound up coming here with, with my own consigliere, Sonny Galazzi, down there. And we were looking at the waterfront and urban renewal. I don't think we'd acquire any land then. We were just looking at it. And if you stood over here on Clerk Park and looked westerly, you would have seen piles of gravel, oil tanks, coal piles, a foundry, scrap pile. If you drove along Bay Street, you couldn't even see the water. It was so bad. So we had hired... A consultant, Faludi. We thought he was Italian, but he wasn't Italian, but he had an Italian name. He said to us, <laughs> he says, most cities have a center, but the Sault Ste. Marie doesn't have a center. If there's a revolution, the revolutionaries won't know where to, to gather. <laughs> so we, we decided to, to get rid of the old city hall before it fell in on our, our head. Uh, but the council split. Uh, most of a good, not most of them, but quite a few of them wanted to build it on the same site over there, Queen Street, which wasn't a bad idea. Walter Chisholm from Ward 5 wanted it on the second line, like the PUC. Uh, there was one councilman who was considered himself a structural expert and said to us that if we built it here, it would immediately fall into the St. Mary's River when it was built. And he believed it. And some hadn't decided. So there was only a couple of us, I'd say, Jerry Maguire, Sonny Galassi, and myself at the start, and we gradually got the council convinced that we'll do two things at the same time, have a center and clean up the waterfront. Now, it's easy to say the council has a consensus, but then you have to go and convince the public. <laughs> what a campaign. I went out there with a styrofoam model of the waterfront, meeting to me, trying to explain to people why we we're putting this brand new building in the middle of an industrial mess. And I tell you, half the city thought we were a little crazy doing it, but we, we decided to do it. The woman who ran against me, I'll never forget her, she was a follower of the councilman who said it was going to fall into the river. And she kept saying, you can't trust this Irwin. He's a spendthrift. He intends to buy a very expensive, solid gold chandelier and put it right up there in the center of city council. And it's going to go into the river with the rest of the building. That was the campaign. It was, wasn't that great. Anyway... <laughs> Nothing's changed, has it? <laughs> Still the same. Okay. Anyway, after the, after the campaign was over, I got a shovel and I got, I contacted the three living mayors, John Rhodes, Alec Harry, and uh, and Jim McAdary, and came down to this spot. It was the only open spot here, by the way, and put the shovel in the ground and uh, and then that's what it was going to be. I don't even know if we hit the right spot. As a matter of fact. So then we had to start cleaning up, and the first place we looked at was Bonder Park over here. There were three companies there, Beaver Lumber, Big Master Oil Tanks, Tank Farm, and the Canadian Steamship Property, CSL, on the, on the waterfront. Now, Beaver was easy because they'd had a fire the year before, and they wanted to buy it. They wanted to sell it, so we, we bought them. Now, Big Master was tough. He lawyered up. He wanted the best price, and, and we had some tough negotiating. Our negotiator was Jerry Duffy. I don't know if Jerry's in here. He was, he's downstairs. And uh, we finally worked out a price. Give him a check. He went to Mexico for the winter. <laughs> I think we paid for that trip. And 
He sent me this beautiful Christmas card. He had an artist do it up down there. It was a bunch of oil tanks with arms, legs, heads, and dancing in a circle. And one was holding a great big Sault Ste. Marie check above it. And below it said, thanks a lot, Ron, and Merry Christmas. <laughs> then we looked up, up here. There was, how many, I think there was, a, I think there was eight businesses between here and, and Queen Street. Yeah, there was. And we had to clean that up. And uh, we went to, 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 we, uh, we went to, uh, to Bay Street first and worked out the deal for the Senior Citizens Tower. And then we, someone got the idea, I can't remember who, let's have a, a, a drop-in center down there. So we worked it out, got all the figures, preliminary figures, went to see the Minister of, uh, Natural Res of, Minister of Housing in Toronto. There was a delegation from the Sioux. We had an appointment. He wouldn't let us in his office. He sat on the other side of the door, and we sat in his other office for almost an hour. And finally, we sent a message in that if he didn't come out to see us, we were going directly to the premier's office and talk to him. We didn't even know where the premier's office was, what I tell you. So he came out, worked out. It wasn't a very happy meeting, but we worked out and got that. So then, now this is, can you imagine, about a 10-month or 11-month period. Here's what we picked up to here. A cab stand, a rent, uh, uh, a real estate office, a car dealership, a rooming house, an engine repair shop, a chamber of commerce building, the ferry ferry um, uh, shop, a tire shop on on, uh, on uh, Bay Street, and leveled everything. I think the only thing was left were those two pillars that you put the sign on. That was it from here there. After that was done, then the foundry. Now, how we ever allowed a foundry to be built in the middle of Sault Ste. Marie is beyond me. It was smoke and everything, forges and furnaces right over here where, where the, uh, uh, the, the lottery is now. Got that, leveled that. We started with Trader Metal next door and, and, uh, and um, uh, Traders and, uh, no, pardon me, McLean's next door and Traders up there. But that was preliminary because it took years to, for the councils to get rid of them. The interesting one I found was the Ermatinger house across the street. You should have seen it. It was a boarding house. It was in complete disrepair. And there were some, we have good volunteers in the suit, a lot of them. Gladys Meanies was, was part of the Historic Sites Board. It was an architect, Perry Short, an architect, and several others for nothing, took that building and brought it up to what you see today. I remember Perry Short taking milk, boiling it, and putting paper in it to try to make it look old. That's how involved they were with that place. Then we had the opening, the whole council went over in costume. <laughs> and what we're looking at is all these old houses on Pimp Street and along St. Thomas, both sides, which are gone now. And I would say there are about two dozen of them. And they were in bad shape. A couple in not bad shape. Mad, but most of them were just dilapidated. And the backyards faced the Ermatinger. The council talked to a guy called Nick Hurt in engineering and said, Nick, we'll put up the money for it. We want you to buy every house as it becomes available and immediately demolish it. And he, he took it on. The guy was a, was a, was a wonder. He uh, came to Canada as, as an immigrant, and he just was dying to do it. Now, the people over there were not too happy with us. The, the house had come up for sale, and a month later, <laughs> it's gone. So you have house, lot, house, lot. And they, they were really upset with the council. But eventually, they all sold out, and we cleaned that out. Now, look, this council has done wonders with the waterfront. You know, I love what you're doing on, on Bay Street with those trees. And I know some of the people are complaining, we've got too many bikes. You're doing a heck of a good job. What you've done, this building is great. Then the, the two million bucks you're allocating to bring the water, the, the paths up on the waterfront, fantastic. You can go down to that waterfront every night and see the people that are really enjoying that waterfront. It's amazing, you know, with your chairs and singing and everything. So I think, I know a lot of you, or your parents and your grandparents, I think this is the council that's going to finish the job over there and pick up the Sun Oil property and finish off the Urban Timber House. I think this is the council that's going to do it. If you don't, some developer is going to buy it. We're going to have more apartment buildings down there that we don't need. They can put an apartment building any place in the city. Now, 
There were some other purchases, but I'm not going to bother you with them. The, the next one was interesting. The Texaco oil tanks, they're big ones over here. And they were some mysterious company, some somewhere in the world with their head office. They really looked down at us in Sault Ste. Marie, this little city up in uh, northern Ontario. They sent up a football player to negotiate, big guy to negotiate. He threatened Duffy. We thought he was joking, you know, but we didn't know. Either. So we hired a guy from Minnesota, really no oil, oil tanks values, put a value on it, and sent a message to Texaco. You got three choices. Accept, negotiate, or litigate. And stop sending us football players. Now, we didn't scare Texaco. I mean, no one from the Sioux is going to scare Texaco. But I noticed they were a lot more polite after that to Duffy. And eventually, we got that oil tank farm. Now, here we had fun. You have no idea how dangerous it is to take down an oil tank. I mean, after the fuel's gone, you still have gas in there, and the guys are using blowtorch. Up in the north side of the Sioux, we blew one up. The guy didn't know what he was doing. He blew it. The thing went up like a rocket, and no one was hurt. I don't know how. I would come down here every day. <laughs> Watch them take it down plate by plate until they cleared all that. Now, I was lucky. You know, I had, I had an excellent counsel. I mean, they were really good. I mean, you know, look at that. We, in such a short time doing all this, we looked at Bayview, and the West Avenue was turning Gooley Avenue into a lake. You can't imagine the damage up there. You, to me, you're too young. Maybe, maybe Rick's vaguely remember his parents might have told him before we were too, too young. They, with partnerships with the Conservation Authority, the province, the federal government, that whole river was moved further west. That was a big project, and there's no more flooding up there. Similarly, on the east end at Clark Creek, they didn't need to move it, but engineering and, and construction, they, they solved the problem of flooding on, on Clark Creek near my house. Then uh, uh, Mark's Bay came up for sale. It was privately owned, by the way. And uh, the, some of the councilmen said, look, you know Leo Bernier. Leo was a provincial minister of natural resources, a conservative. You know, you all know I'm a liberal. We got along well. He was from Kenora. They said, talk to Leo. So I phoned Leo up. I said, Leo, we'd like you to pick up Mark's Bay. And he says, I can't. I said, why not? He said, Art Wishart wants Batchewana Island. It was for sale there, and it's for sale, still for sale today. I said, look, if you got a boat and you got a few bucks, that's Batchewan Island. But Mark's Bay is what we did in Sault Ste. Marie. Leo surprised me. I mean, he and Art was the attorney general. They were colleagues. He broke with Art. Look, came to Sioux, looked at it, he broke with him. And he went with, with Mark's Bay and, and, and not with, with Art Wishart. That was a, that was a surprise. Then uh, after that, the first municipal marina was by that council. There was none. And we couldn't put it down here because there was too much junk still. So we put it on Pine Street in that Bellevue Marina. It's a beautiful spot. I've been walking there since the corona disease. And that's beautiful what they've done between the, 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 the marina and Bellevue Park. That was done by this council, that council. The first industrial park. Businessmen were coming to us, you know, especially in your family. <laughs> Businesses were coming to us. They're taking too long to develop. Too, too long. Could, it takes a year to get the land, zoning, rezoning, OMB. So the council bought that large tract of land east, west of the Highway 17, and uh, it's still there. Uh, zoned it, serviced it, and sold the lots uh, for cost. We made the money on those, and it was a good idea. Then the first municipal swimming pool. This one was interesting. Southern Galazzi over there had played, went away to play junior A hockey. He never learned to swim. I know there are a lot of Mark and Johns here. He's the only Mark and John in the world. From from final of the family that never learned to swim. He came back, came back to Sioux, and he was obsessed with the idea that no kid should drown because they never had a chance to swim. Now I'm telling you, senior citizens were popular in my day, building them, but not swimming pools, municipal swimming pools. That people would say, "Oh, good idea, Ron, but too expensive. They could, there's lots of lakes around here they can learn." He just kept after council and picking up one member at a time until he had a majority. So the Queen Elizabeth swimming pool was built because of that guy and no other reason at that time. Anyway. Well, I think of that council. I think of a finish word. 
Sisu means guts. That is, that is a council that had a lot of Sisu, a lot of Sisu. So they always finished. I had a young family. I decided to take a break. So my, the only meeting I had here as mayor was the first meeting of this council right here. And there was an election. I'm sitting in my house a couple months after, and a friend phoned me up and says, Ron, can I come down and see you? I said, sure, come on down. Came down to the house, put the Detroit Press on, Detroit Free Press on my, on my kitchen table and said, read this. Front page was a picture of our waterfront. Front page of Detroit Free Press and a glowing article, but I don't remember what exactly it was said, but of this I remember. What the Canadians at Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario have accomplished with imagination and single-minded resolve to change their waterfront from an eyesore to a people to a people place is something that we in Detroit should study and follow. That was a high compliment to the whole, the whole community, all the people in the Sioux. I left, came back, and you couldn't find a worse time. I ran federally in the middle of a depression. Algomastia was at that time 13, 12, 13,000. They were being laid off a thousand at a time. And uh, I stood at the gate sometime watching the guys knowing they never go back to a good paying job. It was pretty, pretty, it's pretty sad. The whole country was like that, and everybody was trying to, 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 to save their own communities. And crazy things were happening here besides that. Uh, for instance, the museum was at the, at the armories. I don't know if any of you remember it. They've been there so long, they were called the Military Museum. The military evicted them. They evicted them. I don't know why. They had no money and no place to go. So they came and saw me, and uh, the only thing I could think of was the second floor of the old post office over there. It was empty. Public Works was in the first. They had the whole building. So I contacted the guy in Ottawa uh, who did, did, did that type of negotiations, and I said, put him in the second floor. He says they got it if they pay economic rent. I said, economic rent. What happened? They had no money. So what happened is Paul Cosgrove, uh, Paul Cosgrove uh, came to town, the minister. We took him down there, showed him the second floor. He did a strange thing. That day, he came downstairs and told his staff, start looking for areas outside of this building that they can rent. They're going to empty the building and turn it over. By the way, I think they charged you a few dollars. They weren't supposed to because Paul Cosgrove said, give it to the city of Sault Ste. Marie for a museum. The other thing we found was the federal government owned some water locks down there in front of the CSL. That was funny. Let me back up a bit on this one. I said, this is great. We can get those water locks. So I contacted the, to the, the federal government, Ministry of Transport, and asked for those water locks. We're going to make a park. <laughs> the guy says, you can have them if you pay them market value. They must have all gone to the same school with this market value nonsense. I said, you let the CSL use them for decades for nothing, and you're going to charge us? I said, we're not going to pay you a darn cent. I talked to one of the members of the, of the, of the, the board last night, and I said, do we ever get a deed? I don't think we ever got a deed. But you filled them all, <laughs> all in, and it's all spent it over. So if the feds want it back, they're going to have to dynamite that property to get it. So then, here's a, here was a sad one, uh, the St. Mary's River. We've been poor guardians of that river. Now, some of you as old as me remember that all our sewage from our toilets went directly into that river. No, there was no, no treatment at all into the river. And every industry in the Sioux was dumping toxic, toxic material in there. I'll give you an example. I'll go almost steal. I know you work there, Sonny, but I don't care. They were so alive as a student, so did everybody else. Phenol is a toxic material from the Coke ovens, okay? It came directly from the Coke ovens and exited just where the casino was. It was a black stream about five feet wide and five feet high, and it, it went out about two feet below the, the water level. I saw it. I lived up there. It went into the, that river for at least 50 years that I know. That's first, okay? Traders metal. Now, we weren't, about, weren't worried about the metal, but they were getting batteries up there, Traders Metal, and they were dumping the acids. I don't know where the acid went from Traders Metal. If you had, you change your car to gas station. The guck oil went into the sewers, into the river. The same with the chrome plant, and you're looking at a chrome plant again. Remember, you know, don't trust the experts to come here and say that we will call just a little bit. 
make sure that what they're doing is correct. The tar plant at from Algoma Steel, Abbott Tibby pulp and paper, the tannery over in Sioux, Michigan. You know what was unique about all these companies? They were all upstream of the water intake for the whole city. It was just out here in the river where, where the mall was. That's where it was. When I was mayor, Don Evans came to see me. He says, they've had to stop dredging in the St. Mary's River. I said, what for? He said, they've discovered arsenic in the river bottom. Can you imagine arsenic in the river bottom? They are certain it comes from industry. They don't know which one. They think it's Abbott Tibby, but they can't be certain. I said, well, why don't they continue? He says, they're frightened, worried that if they continue, they might dislodge it. It's safer to be left in. It may be even still out there. I have no idea, but we just stopped the dredging. The PUC wisely said we're going to grow cap. But it was a big budget item, huge. You know, everything that had to be built out there. And uh, there was no money because of recession. Then the city had broken sewers and used sewers. They had a budget, I think it was about equal. So you had two equal budgets and no contribution. They went to the federal government, they went to the provincial government, nothing. So what happened? <laughs> The, the, the federal government decided to have an infrastructure program because we got this depression. And let me explain how it worked. Pierre de Bene was at the top of this pile of money that was allocated by province. He separated provincially to the different provinces depending on population and need. And then one minister from each, from each, for each province would meet with the provincial minister and they would look at the, the uh, proposals from the city and pick the best ones. The Sioux only put in the sewer that time, and they were only looking for partial because they figured they'd never get both. Now, I went and talked to the guy, the minister who was responsible. I'm not giving you an agenda either. I mentioned guy, I'll say the minister I talked to. And the minister said to me, and I told, we talked about this, it was easy. We're in the same party, we sit together. He said, the Sioux's project is a good project. This is what we're looking for. This will be top of the list. For, this, for the meeting in Toronto. They had the meeting, I didn't hear anything. So I went and talked to the minister, I said, how'd it go? He said, and the minister said to me, and this is exact words, because I've got them brand on my mind, I'm sorry, Ron, but the Sault Ste. Marie project was rejected. No, that's what, that's what I was told. And it was puzzling to me, you know, why if the feds wanted it, and the city wanted it, then the province must have turned it down. The provincial minister was Leo Bernier, our friend. So I phoned Leo up and I said, Leo, you know, I said, what are you doing? Why, why are you turning the, the Seuss project down? He said, I didn't. I said, yes, you did, because there's two agreed. He said, I didn't. I said, well, tell me what happened. He said, I'm not going to. I said, come on, tell me. He said, okay, I'll tell you what happened. The feds didn't even put the Seuss St. Marie project on the table for discussion. Can you imagine that? That was like getting kicked in the groin, you know, at that time. So I had a meeting with, uh, I called, I asked uh, Jimmy Cooch, who was the, the chief of staff of the prime minister for a meeting, briefly told him what, it, what was the problem. And I got a hold of Morris Foster. We went over and met with Cooch at the Langerman block. And <laughs> he was having, funny what you remember, he was having his tea. He loved his tea at one o'clock, this cup of tea. And I explained to him what happened. And, uh, and I said, look, I've been diddled and Sue Stray Marie has been diddled. I swear to you that middle is not a word I use. I said, you know, this, this shouldn't have happened. I didn't even think he was listening. He put his teacup down. <laughs> he turned to Pierre de Benet. He says, Pierre, do the soup projects, both of them, and cover cost 100%. You should have seen de Bene. He says, Jim, how in the hell can I do that? The money is gone. It's been all, all, all allocated across the provinces. Coots turned to me and says, do it, put it through the Prime Minister's office, and, and we'll pay it through a consolidated revenue. That's how it was done. Now, it took a couple of years for this, all of the work to be done. But by the time it was done, uh, we'd lost the federal government, and Mulroney was the Prime Minister, and they had a wonderful reception out there, and a big party. So I hear, because Morris Foster and I were, were not invited to the party. Anyway, that's, that's the way it goes. Then, you know, you laugh, that's it. <laughs> the thing that befuddled me the most, though, was the closing of the canal. It was closed for nine years. Yeah. And 
I couldn't understand because they held the writing. They had a cabinet minister here. Why would Mulroy? Now, I'm telling you, I've been in cabinet. You don't do something that significant unless it's a cabinet decision with the approval of prime minister. So as far as I'm concerned, Mulroney closed that canal. And the idea that they had, which I found out later when I was in cabinet, they were going to let it deteriorate to such an extent that the wall and did get really bad, fall in, and the, and the part was going to come back and say, for safety reasons, we're going to backfill the whole canal. This was the actual plan. It's staggering, isn't it? Now, as it happened, uh, Cretchen decided to make a second run for prime minister. <laughs> the first one was closed, but it was, it was kind of brutal. I was surprised he wanted to do it again. So he asked me to run, and I, 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 was, I was 60 years old, and I didn't want to run again, and I put my time in. But because it was him, I said, okay, I'll do it one more term, and that's it. So he decided to come to, he, he won the Calgary Convention. He decided to come to the Sioux, and Royce Fiaconi, you guys all remember Royce. He and I met him up at the, at, the, uh, at the airport and took him in, and we were taking him to the Holiday Inn, now Delta, and we were just chit-chatting. And, and uh, <laughs> we got to Huron Street in Queen, and I said to Royce, he turned right here, and Gretchen says, ah, now we're going to look at your canal, right? I can never put anything past that guy. So we went in, and it was dark. It was getting dark, and it was run down. And uh, he loved history. He loves history. All, ours, all countries. So we went over the history of the 1870 rebellion out here and, and the Chikora. And you got to understand, the Americans had, had invaded us three times then. As a matter of fact, in 1870, we were being aided by the Fenians from 1866 to 1871 across the border. So there was no real love between the Americans and us at that time. And, they, they, and, they, and their, their record was two losses and a draw in those wars, so they weren't happy campers. But what they did was pretty small, prevent our soldiers from going up to, 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 to quell the rebellion, to make our soldiers get off and walk through the bush six miles where the Chikor went through. So anyway, I said to John, look, I gave you my word, I'm going to run one term, whether you want to or not open this canal, but I want it opened. Gretchen never makes fast decisions. He wandered, we were getting dark, and Roy, she and I were standing there, he walked over and looked at the canal again, he came back, he said, you know, this canal is not only significant to Sault Ste. Marie, it's significant to the whole country. If I'm elected prime minister, then we'll put up a budget big enough to restore the canal, but don't overspend because I want to balance the budget. And that's it. And he did all three. He made it to prime minister, he balanced the budget, and he opened the canal. I felt so badly about Elin. She was such a great person. Such a great person, I correct you. you know, she was always there, always counseling. She knew, she knew Suze and me as well as I did. She knew the city, he knew the city. And uh, it's, just, it's just a loss. I want to send our con the condolences from all of my family and, and all the city council members to their family. because it's, it's, it's a sad day for, for Jean. Anyway. <laughs> I wound up in cabinet, and you know the history of that thing, 603 Indian Reserves. Can you imagine dealing with 603 chiefs? Actually, there was more. The Mohawks had two chiefs, one hereditary and one elected. And they all seemed to have my cell phone number. Okay? So I got involved in the referendum by way of a curve. It wasn't my show. It was, it was the, the prime minister's. Because I had to go into Quebec often because we had so many First Nations there. Well, the Crees, the Inuit, the Mohawks did not trust the separatists. So they held their own referendum, and they voted 92, 93, and 95% against partition. So when the vote was counted and it was defeated by a small margin, I'd had it. That was the second one I'd been through. I was parliamentary secretary on the first one and then this one. Waste of money, waste of time, waste of energy. It's just... It's it's, a, it's an ego trip for a small group of people. I called a press conference in downtown Montreal. Big, it was a big gathering. And I said, look, let's get real. 
Quebec is not a country. Quebec is a province. They're, 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 the development of, of Quebec by the French Canadians is not north-south, it's east-west. They came from New Brunswick on the north shore of the St. Lawrence River up to northern Ontario and down the Mississippi. The northern two-thirds of Quebec is habited, inhabited by native people and their right is superior to the Francophones on self-determination. If they want to go the next time, they're looking at a little strip of land on, on the... On the, on the, on the on the St. Lawrence, and if they want to take the Quebec North Teach, take them because they want to go to another country, but the Montreal Canadiens, they're ours. <laughs> so they went bananas. They went bananas. First, the media, they said, where are you getting this about their superior right? And then I had them. I had the opinion from, from Daniel Turp. You don't know him. Daniel Turp is a scholar. He's in the He's a lecturer in the University of Montreal on constitutional law and on uh, uh, well, mainly constitutional law. And he's also a lecturer in Paris. But what's more important, he's a card-carrying separatist, a member of their, part, of their uh, party, an advisor to Boucher, an advisor to, to, uh, to Paris, and he ran for them once. And I had his option. Don't ask me how I got it, but I got it. And I pulled it out. It was his opinion to Perizzo and Bouchard and the separatists that the Quebecers, the Francophones, had a right of self-determination, which I question. But the second paragraph was important. But the Indians of Quebec have a superior right because they've been there a lot longer than the Fran Francophones. It was a bombshell. You should have seen the Quebec press. I got called every name in the book by the separatists, by Bouchard, by the media. And I really didn't care because Gretchen looked at it and he said, this is their Achilles heel. And that became the government policy. If Canada is divisible, then so is Quebec. And every government since that has stayed with it. And if it ever changes, get rid of the government that we have in Ottawa, whoever it is, and remind them that that, that is our policy. If Canada is divisible, then so is the province that wants to divide us. You know... Went over to, uh, to to London. That was a stretch as, a, as an ambassador. I'm not really your ambassadorial type, but I managed it. And then over to uh, the United States and Boston as a consul general, primarily trade and investment. You didn't get involved that much. It's huge. It's huge. It's $2 billion a day between our two countries. $2 billion. We sell them a billion, we buy a billion. It's equal to China's. We're the two top in the world. We buy more goods from the U.S. than any export goods than any country on this planet. So I can't understand why they're always bringing these stupid trade things. They're hurting their best customer, and the people don't even know it. When I landed, Mark and I landed at, at Boston Airport. We landed there exactly Logan Airport. One week after the terrorists left there with the planes they hijacked, one week and ran them into the, the, the towers in, in New York. It was chaos. The Americans didn't trust us, anybody, especially us. They, remember they said the terrorists came through Canada? I don't recall that. That, that. that took them about two months to figure out they landed there in the United States as tourists. And then it just got crazy. Shaney was going to bring vengeance on the, on the terrorists. The terrorists were Saudis. Their leader was a Saudi. The dirty money was Saudi. And who does Cheney want to go against? The Iraqis, who had nothing to do with it. Now, how he was going to do it, remember the big lie, weapons of mass destruction? They prepared the, they prepared the Americans of security that came to that conclusion. Five countries looked at it, and we were one of them. The Americans bought in. Powell, remember at the UN, he wrecked his reputation. Tony Blair bought in hook, line, sipper, sinker. And we were under tremendous pressure, Gretchen on his side, me on the other. On our side, it was primarily Tony Blair, not Bush, that brought the pressure on, on, on Jean. And on my side, there wasn't a day that went by when someone would say to me, some senator or congressman, you've got to tell your prime minister this, you've got to tell your prime minister this, you've got to be with us, you've got to be with us, you're our allies, we've got to take those Iraqis out. The part that got, the one that got me the most, and I never said anything, to, was this one. If, if you're attacked, us, 
who's going to protect you if you don't come over and protect you? That one, the one that got me the, the most, okay? Anyway, our defense intelligence section looked at the American stuff and came, and, and their finding was that their conclusion, the Americans, was false. Canada told the Americans, look, this war is wrong, it's immoral, it's immoral, too much blood is being shed, too much blood of innocent people, we're out of it. And, and all that, that, was, that was a great day for when, when he said that. Anyway, I'm going to end it there. I'll start with the story that I bang on with, and you've, you've been so indulgent so far, but I don't get much of a chance to talk now, so it's once every 50 years, so what the hell? <laughs> My mother, with that accent I talked about when I went up, right over here opposite Sandro's, at that time there was no Sandro's, that's true. there was ditches on the side, of the side of the road. There were six of us in the car. I was there, my father. He wasn't driving. The, the car hit the soft shoulder over into the, the ditch, and none of us had a scratch except my mother. She hit her head on the ceiling, and, uh, and she wound up as a quadriplegic for, for 17 years, bedridden, you know. So she was here. And I was up in, in the West End with my grandmother. And my grandfather, uh, Camilo, uh, died a, a year after I moved in there, an industrial accident at Algoma Steel. Uh, now, every day I would phone my mother down here and we'd talk. And she'd say to me, or I'd come down by bus and when I was old enough, and she'd say, how'd you do in school? Uh, what have you done? What have you achieved? And I'd talk to her and say, look, there's... You know, I didn't achieve much in school. This is what happened. You know, I said, it's tough. And she says, come here. So I go over to the bed and she said, look. Give me a second. She'd say, life is tough. She should remember, just put your head down and keep going straight ahead. I promise you, you'll get there. That's a promise. Now, she, she, her name was Antonetta. My daughter, Tony, carries that name. When I went off to, uh, to, to university, she'd learned, she was a pianist, but, and, but that was all gone. She'd learned to invert two pencils and type the rubber end, and she used to send the most wonderful notes. You'll have to excuse me. So the, now, my name's on the building. I climbed the ladder. But in fact, it was her and all those other ones who were here before me that, that brought that ladder. It was my wife, Mark, and his pleasure, and they held it up so it wouldn't fall off. So in honoring me today, you honor all of them, for which I thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you to the entire Irwin family for uh, spending the time with us that you did today. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, Ron, uh, your address was considerable, was uh, considerably more significant or, or voluminous than the address that you sent me ahead of time. Uh, and, and, uh, and you certainly have had a very rich uh, history with a lot of experiences. And uh, as I indicated in my remarks, you've always worked hard and you've been dedicated to your community and your country. Uh, so we, we are very close to our planning agenda, which has to happen at 5.30. And we're not going to get into consent, Council. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go to Section 8 and deal with the Council motions, hopefully get those done, and then we'll go to planning at 5.30 because we have a number of people calling in. But that represents the conclusion of our uh, a dedication ceremony. So thank you. Thank you. 
Actually, Mr. Mayor, I hadn't realized uh, we have finished our proclamations. Oh, yeah, we, we do have proclamations. So, so we will get to those. Madam Clerk, we'll deal with the proclamations then. Agenda item 5.2 is Latin Hispanic Heritage Month. So, uh, happy to do this proclamation. We have a lot of people I understand from our Latin Hispanic community watch. Well, they were going to be watching at 4.30. Seeing as we're close to 5.30, I'm not sure if they're still tuned in. Uh, but if they are, I'd like to say hello to them and read this proclamation for them on their behalf. In October 26, 2016, the House of Commons officially recognized October as Hispanic Heritage Month. And in June 20th, 2018, the House of Commons officially recognized Latin American Heritage Month under Bill S-218. Whereas Hispanic Canadian Heritage Month provides 23 Latin Hispanic countries with the opportunity to share information with other cultural communities within the context of the Canadian values while preserving their language, diverse cultures, and traditions. Whereas Hispanic and Latin American Heritage Month is an opportunity to celebrate the achievements and contributions of Hispanic Canadians, as well as share their story, contributions, and culture. Whereas Hispanic Canadians are committed to preserving their rich heritage and language while contributing to the growth and development of the city of Sault Ste. Marie, our Canadian mosaic in the fields of art, music, literature, film, economics, science, sport, medicine, education, and public life. Whereas Hispanic Canadian Heritage Month demonstrates the city of Sault Ste. Marie's commitment to quality and inclusion through community initiatives, participation, engagement, and activities. Therefore, I, Christian Provenzano, as mayor of the city of Sault Ste. Marie, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2020 as Latin Hispanic Heritage Month in the city of Sault Ste. Marie. And agenda item 5.3 is Hunger Action Month. So we have a proclamation for Hunger Action Month. Whereas hunger and poverty are important issues that have serious effects on a person's overall health and well-being. Whereas one in eight households in Ontario experience some degree of food insecurity due to poverty, with Sault Ste. Marie believed to have even higher rates. Whereas the number of visits to food banks and soup kitchens in Sault Ste. Marie increases every year. Whereas the City of Sault Ste. Marie is committed to taking steps to combat hunger and raise awareness in the community about this important issue. Whereas Hunger Action Month calls attention to the struggles of those in food insecurity and local organizations working to fight it. Now therefore I, Mayor Christian Provenzano, as Mayor of the Sault Ste. Marie, do hereby proclaim September as Hunger Action Month in the City of Sault Ste. Marie and encourage residents to learn more about the subject and to take part in actions to fight hunger in our community. Under Agenda Item 5.4, Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. We do this proclamation every year with Zonta International and the Zonta Club of Sault Ste. Marie and Area, and I just want to recognize them and their great work for our community. Whereas Zonta International's mandate is to advance the status of women through service and advocacy. Whereas the Zonta Club of Sault Ste. Marie Area advocates for women's health through local service projects, in particular the Ovarian Cancer Awareness Campaign, we ask the community to join us in learning about one of the most deadly cancers among women. Whereas Ovarian Cancer Canada strives to increase awareness of this disease, provides women care and support, and provides research funds to change the outcomes for those living with the disease. Now therefore, I, Christian Provenzano, by virtue of the power vested in me as Mayor of the City of Sault Ste. Marie, do hereby proclaim this month of September 2020 as Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month and urge all citizens to share the information about this often overlooked and underdiagnosed cancer. And agenda item 5.5 is Recovery Month. Before I... I read this proclamation, I wanted to take a minute and speak to the community. On, on the agenda tonight, there are uh, uh, two letters. Uh, there is a, a, a communication uh, from myself to Minister DiBolo, uh, a provincial minister, associate minister of health, minister of mental health and addictions. And there's a letter to myself to Minister uh, Ahmad Hussein and Parliamentary Secretary Adam Vaughan, they're federal ministers. Uh, the first letter is to Minister DiBolo on uh, the, the real need in our community for additional uh, mental health and addiction services. And the second letter uh, to the federal ministers is a minister on our need for funds for housing. I know Councillor Dufour and the DSAB are working on those initiatives. Uh, the pandemic has laid a number of things bare across our country, but certainly it has made some of the socioeconomic issues in our community uh, very visible and present. Uh, and I, I want the city uh, to know I want the city to hear us say that we acknowledge the challenges in the community, uh, that we're not insensitive to them, that we see them, uh, and that we know that a number of people have significant need. 
uh, we can see uh, homelessness, we can see poverty, we can see mental health and addiction issues uh, across our community, and we can see the effect they're having on our community. Uh, these are really complex uh, problems to address, and problems we certainly need to address with our federal and provincial partners. But they're challenges that we are talking about and we're mindful of and we're working together on as a community with our Social Service Administration Board, with City, with Sault Ste. Marie Police Services, and with our GOMA leadership team. So I just I want uh, the community to, to, to hear and recognize uh, us say uh, that we're here and that we see it and that we want to be part of the solution and we want to offer the supports and that although we're struggling to, and we know in some cases we're not succeeding, uh, we're trying and we'll continue to make those efforts. Uh, so with that noted, um, I'm going to read the Proclamation Recovery Month. Whereas many of our citizens and their families have been and continue to be affected by addiction, and whereas steadfast and courageous individuals who have acknowledged their dependencies and have made the decision to move to a life of recovery should be celebrated and supported by the community, and whereas the community inspires sustainable recovery by providing support founded on the principles of compassion, trust and unity, along with providing an environment in which individuals and families are assisted in developing the skills necessary to live freely in recovery. Whereas those in recovery with the guidance and assistance of recovery service providers are working to overcome addiction and tangibly improve the health of the community. Whereas Recovery Month provides us with an opportunity to recognize the need to end stigmas around addiction, educate our community, and celebrate the recovery of those who fought hard and overcame their addiction. And therefore, I, Christian Province Adams Mayor of the City of Sault Ste. Marie, do hereby proclaim the month of September as Recovery Month. I encourage all citizens to recognize and support individuals in our community recovering from addiction. So, uh, I think the time's 532, right? So we have to move to planning. The Deputy Clerk is just going to check the Z. So we have to move to our planning agenda. Welcome to Zoom. And Enter your participant. You are in the meeting now. There are 19 participants in the meeting. This meeting is being recorded. So we have 19 people that are uh, on the uh, call that have called in. That will be managed by the deputy clerk. Okay, go on, Council Bernie. Okay, I'll ask my question. I know there was uh, several individuals downstairs who wanted to come in council chamber. Yeah, the council chamber is not open to the public. Yeah, yeah, the council chamber is not open to the public. Now, I'll have to have the clerk or the CEO confirm, but all of those people would have been given the opportunity to participate by teleconference. Is that not the case? If I have the, 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 the uh, CAO's microphone, please. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bruni, yes. Uh, the notice that was provided uh, to the residents for this meeting indicated that they needed to register with the clerk's department, and uh, it was noted in that notice that uh, representation would have to be done by uh, phone or uh, Zoom. Go ahead, Councillor Shoemaker. Sorry, I apologize, Councillor Bruni. You have a question, Councilor Bruni? Yes, uh, uh, to Mr. White. How are these people notified? And I guess the one I'm, I'm speaking on is regarding Donna. How are they notified that they can call in um, and they were not allowed to attend the meeting in person? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Bruni, I'm going to have to defer to either the city clerk or the planning director to answer that question on how the notification occurred. Okay, the uh, planning notice indicated that people who wish to speak could uh, register with the clerk and that way we would provide them with the manner of which they could participate either by video or by uh, telephoning into the meeting. And those people who have uh, reached out to us to ask if they could just observe were given the um, uh, Shaw Cable, um, Village Media, and uh, City of Sault Ste. Marie YouTube um, items. I don't believe, I think those were all Garden Avenue people who have called and gotten 
in touch with us to ask how they could observe. I don't believe I had anybody from Donna Drive ask how they could um, observe it. So was something sent to them, a uh, letter informing them? The planning director would be best to uh, answer who would have received the notice. I know it would have been uh, published in the newspaper as required by statute. Um, I, he would be in a better place to tell you who would actually have received the notices. Good afternoon. Uh, is uh, that the planning director? Is Hello? Who's, sorry. Yeah, Carlo, can you just mute? Yeah, so M Madison, can you make sure everybody's muted that's not staff or, or uh, the city council right now? Do we have uh, Mr. McConnell on the line? Mr. McConnell, can you answer that question, yes. please? Hello? Can you answer? Did you, did you hear the question, Mr. Yes. McConnell? Hello? Hello? So is Don not able to hear me then? I can hear some hellos. Carlo, it's Don McConnell. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, it's Michael. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So can you hear both Don and Michael? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? So yes, I can. Great. So why is this happening? Wait, try again? Yeah, but I'm not interested in hearing either Carlo or Mr. Friscalanti. No, no, try, try Don right now. Don, can you hear us? Mr. McConnell, can you yes, hear I us? Yes, I can. Okay, can you please answer the question? Did you, did you hear the question? Uh, no, uh, no, Mr. Murray, I did not. Okay. I have just reconnected. Okay. Mr. Br uh, Councilor Bruni, can you please uh, ask the question again to Mr. McConnell? Uh, Mr. McConnell, regarding the residents on Donna, um, how were they notified that they would not be able to come in person and the only way to communicate uh, if they were against this uh, development was basically by Zoom? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councillor Bruni, all of the uh, surrounding residents were, uh, were sent a letter. They were sending a notice. In there, we indicated that uh, the meeting would be held electronically, and uh, they were welcome to make written submissions, or if they uh, wanted to speak directly to Council, they were to contact the clerk's office. When was this letter sent, do you recall? I was uh, either August 24th or 26th. I forget the exact day, but it was uh, several weeks ago, yes. So do you have a concern, Councilor Murray, that one of the applications didn't provide proper notice to the, the people that live in proximity to that redress? That is correct. Uh, do you want to just kind of walk through that? Maybe we can address it directly. What are you, what are you specifically concerned about? Well, I'm just, my concern is not all Donna residents received this letter or notification that they can participate in a Zoom meeting, and they cannot come here publicly. Um, so that's my concern. So we're not going to get the proper representation from the residents in that area that are basically speaking against the development only because of the road. Yeah. Okay, so I think that information, are you concerned that information isn't in front of council or just the magnitude of it isn't in front of council? Because I think, I think it's well, clear. Well, no, no, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm yeah. just asking the questions. If the residents on Donna received any type of information regarding how they can participate in this meeting here. Yeah, yeah and I think well, if Ms. I mean, they're saying that they've sent them, so that's... Yeah, I, I, get, I think that, that's the information we're receiving, is that they sent that notice to Because the I received two emails, uh, well, sorry, two phone calls today that they were not aware that this was on the agenda. Yeah. So I'm just... Well, what if, I mean, the agenda is published, like, uh, it's public, the agenda is public, so it's, it's it, they might No, no, receive. I'm talking about the letter. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we are in the planning agenda now, and uh, we can begin that. So Madam Clerk, if we could uh, start planning, please. Agenda item 7.7.1, 7 .1, application A120Z, 25 Donna Drive and 468 Second Line West. And we have participating by uh, Zoom, uh, Carlos Batafora as uh, counsel for the applicant, Steve Ficicello uh, as an applicant, and uh, Michael Friscalanti. And I believe they've been admitted from the waiting room. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Can, can now, just uh, so I'm aware, uh, Mr. Spadafora, can you hear me? It's Mayor Provenzano speaking. Mr. 
Frisk Lanny, can you hear me? Just give me a thumbs up if you can. Okay. Okay, good. So, Mr. Spider-Four, are you speaking in favor of the application, or do you, before we get to you, I'll have the planning director just give us a summary of the application, and then after he's done speaking, if you wanted to speak uh, towards the application, we'll start there. So, uh, Mr. McConnell, if you could, uh, we start with you, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The council has dealt with this application previously. Uh, this is the property that is the former Prince of Wales School. It has a frontage on both Donna Drive and Second Line. Uh, the application before Council is a request to permit the construction of 22 townhouse units. Uh, it has been reviewed by staff and is recommended for approval. And Mr. Spadafore is here on behalf of the applicant, Mr. Ficacella. Okay. Mr. Spadafore, can we unmute Mr. Spadafore, please? Mr. Spadafore, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mayor Provenzano. Mayor Provenzano and... Uh, Members of City Council, um, it's my pleasure to be able to address this uh, matter with you as we first saw it February 24th. And just for the sake of uh, setting the context as to uh, what happened at that time, just uh, prior to our attendance on that matter, uh, we were uh, advised that uh, there was in fact a PUC well located in the northwest corner of the property, which was the former Donna Park. Um, and so as a result of it, it required, uh, obviously, an assessment on the part of the development, uh, the developer together with the, uh, together with the PUC to take a look at the location and the details of that well and uh, reconfiguration of the, uh, of the proposed development. Anyways, uh, I will not get into a detailed background on the proponent. I think everybody's familiar with Steve Ficicello and his work, uh, not only, uh, with, uh, what he's proposing here, but also as, uh, the principle of FICMAR. The, uh, the planning report outlines the nature of the development and obviously what is, is, uh, what is we're being, what we're looking at here is essentially development that is keeping in the, uh, in the same context as the types of developments that we're seeing throughout the city. Uh, basically, uh, one level, uh, no basement, uh, units that, uh, basically cater typically to folks that may be looking to sell their places and uh, essentially uh, minimize the amount of maintenance and uh, up and down that they uh, that perhaps they may have in their own homes. Um, obviously, you can see from the proposed plan that there is significant amount of green space, obviously catering to the area and trying to uh, keep it in context within what was developed with West Park 9 and the neighborhood to the north and uh, the general area around uh, the former, or sorry, around this area here, the former location of Prince of Wales. Um, in, terms of, in terms of this uh, particular application, this is a traditional infill type of uh, development. And when we're uh, looking at this, it's important to keep in mind uh, the nature of this development because it drives not only the planning and engineering components of the development, but also uh, the types of concern that we are hearing uh, from the surrounding neighbors and that the developer, I wish to underline this, the developer together with their consultants in consultation with city staff and others have spent a significant amount of time pre-February 24th original meeting and subsequently after in order to look at doing a development that uh, could ideally address the issues that were being raised by the neighbors following the public meeting and uh, at the same time being able to adhere to the requirements that they have to adhere to. Um, as, as I mentioned just a moment ago, the developer has engaged significant uh, uh, time, effort and energy to gather uh, relevant consultant reports, uh, commission those reports and has done a significant amount of investment uh, in trying to ensure that this development happens in the most proper way possible. Uh, aesthetically and architecturally, I think that there's no argument as to what it's going to look like and how it will complement the surrounding neighborhood and fit within the concept of infill uh, development. The developer has looked at multiple ways to configure the development in order to look at what can, uh, what can consultants come up with to address ongoing issues that are being raised. What triggered the meeting to get pushed down to this uh, date today, as I mentioned, is the PUC well, and I wanted to just touch upon that. Um, the discovery of the wall essentially, or sorry, of the well, essentially led to a realization at that point, that well was located essentially 
underneath the kitchen uh, of one of the units where this was planned. And this is an artisanal one. Given the various discussions and assessments with their own engineering consultants, Poet and with C, the issue became how to deal with it. Obviously, they looked at relocating it, they looked at redesigning the development around it, and they looked ultimately with uh, the PUC's decision of decommissioning this well. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't solve the overall issues that perhaps the neighbors would love to see from this development. Uh, but at the same time, we know that this precipitated from the, if you compare the current plan to the previous plan, this precipitated the shift to the south of the western portion of the development, and that would be units 22 on the north through to uh, unit 13 on the south end. What does that mean? Basically, it is to ensure that there isn't a water issue underneath the buildings that are located even after the well, an artesian well is decommissioned, there is upward pressure that can pose a problem and an ongoing problem for the uh, development and in particular the building over it. As a result, it leads to a reconfiguration of the retention pond that is located on the south end of the development, which you will see is an elongated triangular oval, is the best way uh, for me to describe it. And at the same time, uh, you will see that there is uh, a walkway has been reconfigured as it essentially dog legs um, uh, eastward a bit. Um, why is this important? Number one, this is very much a simple case of keeping in tune with good planning principles in terms of the servicing of the property. The size of the retention pond that is there today meets the requirements that need to be met from the purposes for the purposes of training and also for the purposes of ensuring that there hasn't been some sort of significant reconfiguration of the pond solely to fit the developer's uh, requirement in terms of access. Um, at the same time, it also ensures that there is proper pollute removal. It's a shallower pond, so it's safer. You will note that this is closer to the sidewalk and second line and by second line street itself. And this is important, obviously, for the aesthetic and for the safety of uh, not only the folks living in those units, but also the folks nearby. Um, based on that, it's important then to look at how this leads to the issue that we'll get to eventually, the traffic issue and the access. One other point I want to point out, aside from the reconfiguration as a result of the commissioned well to the change in the southern portion of the development, is there is a PUC hydropole installation just to the west of the proposed access point from Second Line, which is a walkway. There, uh, they've identified, it's been identified that there are three primary circuits, a secondary uh, circuit, transformer, bell shaw, et cetera, various installations which, as well as the street light, which when you take it all together, leave us in a situation that it's removal or movement, left, right, east, west, will be extremely cost prohibitive for the developer. So when you take these contexts, uh, when you take these points uh, and these factors into the context of the key issue with regards to this development, it's important to note that obviously from the earlier comments I made with regards to uh, matters such as proper planning, with regards to proper infill development, we look at traffic. The developer has looked at separating the uh, property in half, in a sense, and having the uh, certain uh, units uh, come out onto second line while having other units essentially coming out onto Donna, Donna Drive. The uh, developer has also looked at um, having all the access come out onto second line as well. That's the reason why you would have for you the report uh, uh, of city staff with regards to traffic and the comments there as well as the traffic report and traffic study that the developer has uh, engaged. Um, when you're looking at it, obviously, he did look at it within the lens of trying to see if there was a serious alternative that worked off of Donna, uh, not going off of Donna Drive. However, notwithstanding the look and the, the investigation, the analysis for reconfiguration, it is evident from the reports and from the input, even of city staff, that at the end of the day, the proper way and the best way to develop the 
configure access for this location is Donna Dry. Okay? Number one, the development, with the conclusion, sorry, with regards to the uh, staff report, the development will not impact the traffic on Donna Drive. It will not be a significant or material change and they will have no unreasonable impacts on traffic uh, on Donna Drive. And I'm citing from some of the points that were raised in the city report, uh, city staff report. Number two, the developer's lessons learned from the abutting condo development at West Park 9 uh, raises issues with regards to safety concerns coming onto an arterial road second line. Number three, all residential traffic is going to be happening on Donna Drive. There will be no commercial traffic. And number four, the access onto Donna Drive is appropriate. When we look at the planning report, I draw specifically your attention to the line that states that a byproduct of infill development and residential in inter intensification is a certain amount of additional traffic which may be unsettling for neighbors. Mr. Ficacello, the developer, recognizes that fact, recognizes the concerns on the part of the folks on Donna Drive and on Sussex and in the neighborhood. But at the same time, we need to look at what is the most appropriate way to develop this. When we look at, when we look at the consultant's report and the traffic report from JD Northcote Engineering, I draw your attention to the uh, key parts of this uh, report. Number one, there is sufficient capacity on Donna Drive to accommodate the additional traffic generated by the proposed development. Traffic on Donna Drive will operate with an excellent level of service. There, it is anticipated to have a negligible impact to the excellent level of service on Donna Drive. And it is recognized and it has been brought to the developer's attention and it is not lost on him that the reality is, is Donna Drive does have ditches on the side of it. Yes, there are concerns perhaps with regards to the neighbors in terms of the width of that. Uh, road, but at the end of the day, it's been determined from the consultants and the reports that have been done that it still is in fact for the amount of traffic that will be created here. We are talking about 22 units. Uh, we are talking about potentially maybe 22 cars, uh, some visitors uh, that this is going to drive. I also want to draw your attention to the key point that is raised from the site axis onto second line west. And this is important, I think because it goes to the concept of the alternative that is often proposed for this development. Number one, when we look at that, uh, that analysis, it was raised in reference to the Transportation Association of Canada's own design guide for Canadian roads. And very simply, it is preferable to avoid acts, uh, direct connections between public lanes or local roads, such as the road, private roadway that uh, the development would have, onto, onto uh, with arterial roadways, such as second line. The idea is, is that you lead to a, from a private road, such as that, a local road, to a collector, such as a Sussex or a Donna, and ultimately to a core road second line arrangement. That is critical and important, of course, uh, for the consideration that happens here. Now, mention has been made about alternative sites that are located along second line, including the developer's own uh, development of the condo uh, right next to it. Yes, indeed, those do turn on second line. Yes, indeed, there are uh, other fourplexes and properties that turn on directly onto second line. But here, there is an alternative. In many of those places, including the property next door, there is no alternative. There was no alternative, and therefore, implying good planning principles, this is why the Donner Drive location was determined to be the best location to access it, supported by the access reports. Again, I underline the fact that the developer has looked at alternatives for reconfiguration, has looked at the realities of what they are facing in terms of the retention pond and the reconfiguration because of the PC well, and therefore is left simply with the reality that this is the best use and configuration of this property. It is not an extensive degree of density that is being put on here, which the option was for more, but in keeping with the uh, issues that were raised in ensuring that uh, this is done properly. This is why Mr. Ficacello's proposed plan is uh, before you today. In conclusion, when we look at where we are, the net net, number one, we have, an H, we have a development that satisfies the requirements for infill type of development that the city of course looks for. 
It has been done in conjunction with city staff and with consultants. There really is no alternative. No evidence has been put forward that there is truly an alternative that should strongly be considered. There is no empirical evidence to that fact. Notwithstanding that, the developer has looked at alternatives and notwithstanding what those alternatives may present, the best, most safest way for this development to take place is by the proposal that you have before you. Um, I will close my commentary there and uh, happy to answer any questions that you may have uh, through this process. Okay, so uh, is anybody else, Mr. Spadafore, speaking in favor of the application? Um, just you? Just myself. Mr. Piccicello is here, and uh, Mr. McDonald from Telic Engineering is also here. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take some questions from Council for the applicant. Mr. Frithglan, I know you're there. You will absolutely be given an opportunity to speak to this matter, but what we do is we hear uh, from the applicant, we answer Council's questions. Council might have questions for staff or the applicant, and then I move on to take any other comments that people have on the application. Uh, so we'll start with questions from councillors. We'll start Councillor Bruni, then Councillor Nero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, first of all, I guess to the city clerk, is there anybody on the line to speak against this development? Mr. Well, so we'll, we'll like Mr. Fris Mr. Frisklani is going to be speaking and making some representations. I, I don't want to say they're against the development because I think his letter was pretty balanced, but he, they've got concerns, but he's going to be speaking. Oh, okay. To, but he, going to he was to the only person he's who only registered person. besides gonna, the applicant and applicant solicitor. Yeah, so right now we're dealing with questions. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, to Mr. Spadafora, uh, the study was taken in January. Am I correct? Okay, um, was there any school buses on, on this road, do you know? I didn't see anything on the report. I'm sorry, uh, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councilor Bruni, uh, if you can repeat the question, I, I could not hear it very well because of echo. In the study, was there any school buses registered on Donna? Well, yeah, I'm not, the question isn't clear to me, Councilor Bruni. Is there any school buses that travel the road? No. So, do, do school buses travel on Donna? I don't see that in the report. School buses, sorry, school buses traveling on, Do on, on Donna Drive? Yes, sir. Okay, I don't recall that that was touched upon. Just let me double check here. Okay, so uh, just got clarification from Mr. McDonald. When they do the traffic report, they're doing traffic counts, and that accounts for all traffic on the road, regardless of the nature of the vehicle. Okay. And it's historical traffic counts. Okay, regardless okay. of the nature of the vehicle. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, regarding the setback, um, why, why is this setback required? And maybe Mr. McConnell can answer this. Um, Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Bruni, the, the variance in the setback is the setback from second line west. That variance is normally 10 meters or 30 feet. The, the request is to reduce it to 7.5 meters. That is appropriate in this case because that's actually a side wall. Uh, we uh, will be using site plan control on this property to ensure that it's an attractive side wall uh, from passers-by on second line, whether they be walking or driving. Uh, but that is that is quite a, quite appropriate, particularly for a residential development. Okay, uh, in the report, it stated the stormwater management may be required, and that's from our own engineering. How would we know it's required during development, or is it before? Mr. Mayor, I, I, I assume that question was directed yeah. by Councillor Bruni to me. It, yes, sir, I'm sorry. Uh, we require a stormwater management for all new development where there'll be increasing runoff, the intent being to uh, not have an increase in, in runoff as a result of new development. So there will be uh, a stormwater management fund required for this project. Okay, and Mr. McConnell, regarding the, well, the developer's engineering uh, states that 
that the sanitary capacity is available for this development. Has city staff reviewed this? That would have been reviewed by our engineering department. Perhaps Mr. McDonald can talk about that a bit. Uh, however, it is reviewed again prior to the issuance of a building permit. So my next question uh, to Mr. McConnell is, regarding the current road infrastructure, is it sufficient in your eyes? We do have ditches on both sides. And, and in your, your your answer will probably say uh, be yes because you've approved this report, but I look at it. I, I find that the the road is, is is poor. It's it's more narrow, and the entrance will be very very close to the homeowners. For you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Bruni, we did review this with our engineering and public works people. Uh, the manager of design and transportation engineering has indicated that it will work, that it can work. Uh, and if you have any further questions on the details of that, I believe Mr. Ramil is in attendance tonight uh, as part of this Zoom call. But we did review that with public works and engineering, and they were satisfied with that. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess. My next question would be towards you, uh, to you, Mr. McConnell, regarding a traffic light on second line. Uh, as Mr. Spadafora said, they reviewed every option possible. Was a traffic light reviewed uh, to be installed on second line? As, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor to Councilor Bruni, as far as I know, no, that was not considered. Did Mr. Spadafora want an opportunity to answer that question? Because uh, it seems like it's something that, that the applicant could, could answer. We can unmute Mr. Spadafora, please. Yes, I, uh, I appreciate uh, the question uh, from Councillor Bruni with regards to uh, traffic signage and what have you, including a light. Obviously, from the developer's perspective, uh, when they look at it, there, there was some discussion had, uh, with regards to it. When we look at the uh, report, from uh, the traffic consultant, Northcote. Uh, there is reference in one of the um, summary statements that uh, with regards to traffic signage improvements, uh, they specifically said there were no traffic signage improvements recommended at the study area intersections. So, so the, the and, and it also made reference to the report makes reference to uh, not increasing the number of entrances onto second line, uh, specifically looking at the access point uh, from this development. Thank you. And I guess my question goes back to Mr. McConnell. Why didn't city staff review if a traffic light could be install installed on second line? Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to Councillor Bruni. Putting a traffic light in demands a certain level of, of certain volume of traffic, and it uh, certainly 22 townhouses is not going to generate sufficient traffic to warrant or uh, you know to require the use of another traffic light. And it, it even if it did, uh, the traffic light would then be in between two other streets, very close to two other streets, and that is not a safe. Uh, not, not a safe environment, not, not a safe design. I think in this particular case, uh, and certainly, I mean, again, I defer to Mr. Ramil, but putting a traffic light in here would make the overall traffic flow in the area worse, not better. But you didn't... For a very marginal benefit. Right. So you didn't basically do a study on that if a traffic light could be installed. It just, you're assuming that it would cause more would cause a delay in, in traffic. That's correct. Staff did not do, we did not consider the possibility of putting a traffic light in there, yes. Okay. E, what about a traffic light, say, further west? Was there any consideration for this way traffic would be, I, I know a, a traffic light should not slow down traffic, but obviously it will because there'll be time periods where Cars can travel and cars have to stop, or vehicles have to stop. 
So there's no consideration if possibly put a, 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 a stop sign, red light, flashing lights, et cetera, further west. Mr. Mayor, that is a question that would need to be directed to engineering services. Okay, thank you. As anybody? As I know, no, that has not been considered. Okay, uh, is anybody engineering? Would they be able is, to answer? Is Mr. Ramiel on the line? I am. Uh, Carl, yeah. did, you, did you hear the question? Did you understand the question? Are you in a position to answer the question? To you, Mr. Mayor and Council Bruni, I think I can comment on it. We we uh, install traffic control devices like uh, stop signs, traffic signals, um, on a basis of warrant calculations, which Mr. McConnell has indicated through traffic volumes and turning movements and those types of things. And it's just not warranted. We the the, the increased traffic due to this development wouldn't um, place that warrant on the intersection he's talking about. Um, so no, we haven't done the, 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 the study, but, but, but also uh, my comment was, could a traffic light be installed further west of second line? Here, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Rooney, we would have to look at the specific location and the reason why you're wanting to install a traffic light there. Traffic control devices such as traffic signals, that they're not meant to be uh, traffic calming or to re reduce speed or uh, it, it, the warrant would have to exist there and, and there's, there's uh, defined calculations through the Ontario Traffic uh, Manual to, to do that. Yeah. Um, so in the report it stated 20, uh, what, 22 homes and Mr. Spadafora referenced 20, 22 vehicles. Well, there's going to be more than 22 vehicles. Many homes have two vehicles. Um, so obviously, it will be more than 22 vehicles tra uh, traveling on to Donna, um, plus the approximately 34 vehicles right now that are on Donna. So we're looking at approximately 78 vehicles. Uh, with my calculations, but uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to probably just leave it at that for now, and I'll, I'd like to have closing, uh, sure. make a closing statement at the end. Councilor Nero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, Mr. Spadafora, if I may. I only have one question. Councilor Bruni covered most of the important points as far as I'm concerned. Um, Mr. Spadafora, in your comments, I believe you referred to some utilities that are on the second line frontage of the property that would make it cost prohibitive uh, for the developer to uh, make access there. My apologies if I missed this, but uh, what changed on that frontage from the previous use of the property to the present use? Did utilities go in that weren't there before? Because this property was accessed from second line. Councillor Nero, nothing has changed with regards to that particular uh, installation there. That's correct. Okay, so so I'm confused. I, I I believe you said it would be cost prohibitive because of utilities to have access from second line, but nothing's changed. If we have, to, excuse me, just to clarify that, Mr. Mayor, it is if it has to be moved. And if you look at where that hydro pole is located, given where the proposed access from second line would be located, it would basically be at the point where this hydro pole is currently located. So specifically? So what is the best principle and best location for that access point? Naturally, you can put an access point in uh, Dogtail uh, Roadway, uh, the interior roadway, as far east as possible away from that area. However, that would not make the best, uh, that would not make the best use and configuration of an access road along that location. And that would bring you also to another, I'm just looking at the plan, fire hydrant, which is located to the east just by the uh, property boundary that is uh, up against uh, West Park 9 location. Okay, so just so I'm clear, that it is one uh, PUC pole 
that is in the way right now of having proper access to the plan the way it is shown right now. Without There's changing uh, without changing the roadways at all. Without changing the roadways, there is a hydro pole that is a uh, is an issue uh, with regards to moving it. There is also the reconfiguration of the retention pond, which is now uh, significantly elongated, running from where uh, the most westerly location it can be located over to the most easterly uh, location it can be. And you will note uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Uh, Councillor Nero, sorry, that uh, the access road would run probably at least 50% over the proposed retention bond location. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spatterford. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll have comments as well. Okay, I know to Councillor Shoemaker, who's got uh, questions, Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, I think probably to Mr. McDonald, um, if he's there. Um, with respect to my friend, Councillor Bruni's uh, questions about the, the traffic volume on Donna Drive, does the, end, does the report consider uh, whether or not Donna can, can sustain traffic, an, an additional, I think he, he estimated 75 cars a day? That probably included cars that are already on Donna, based on what I, how I understood his question, but could it, could it handle another 50, another 70? So you're directing that to the proponent's engineer? Is yes. That, yeah. So yes. Uh, Mr. Spadafore, I think you have, uh, you have the proponent's engineer with you. The question was, uh, can Donna Drive handle another 50 cars, 50 to 70 cars a day, if that was the increase in traffic? Yeah, just to clarify to you, Mr. Mayor, to, uh, to council, um, the summary statement from, from the traffic engineer uh, does specifically state that in summary, the proposed development will not cause any operational issues and will have a negligible impact to the excellent level of service experienced currently on Donna Drive. Okay, so that, that was, but that was based, as I understood it, on the representation that there would be 22 cars, one car for each of the units. And I think what Councillor Shoemaker is asking, in accord with Councillor Bruni's comments, if there are two cars for each of the units, you double that. So does 50 cars represent a problem? Yeah, um, just to clarify again, um, in section three and 3.1, it does uh, talk to the traffic generation based on the uh, multi-housing low rise and the, the layout. Um, so it does state 22 units and then it distributes the traffic through the AM and P uh, our traffic. But generally in terms of the amount of traffic generation here, a, um, a rough rule of thumb is we use a two lane road that can, has a capacity of about 400 vehicles per hour. So the traffic that exists and will, that will be generated on this site is well below that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That, that answers it. And, and I'd just ask Mr. Rumiel if he, you know, has, has reviewed and concurs with this. I know he's our traffic guy, so. Uh, Carl, uh, Mr. Romeo, did you hear Council Shoemaker's question? Yes, I did through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council Shoemaker. As Ms. McDonald says, uh, the key numbers there are that it's, it's going to generate 12 peak hour new trips in the AM and 16, sorry, yeah, 16 in the afternoon during the peak hour. Um, I agree with him that, that uh, uh, a two lane road such as Donna Drive can, can generate, can uh, to, uh, handle like several thousand vehicles per day. So I would agree with the 400 vehicles per hour um, and still and still experience a, a very high level of service, probably level of service A. Okay, yeah, perfect, thanks. That answers that question. My next question to you, Mr. Rumiel, is um, I know Council Bruni spent some time on, on traffic signal. My understanding of your question, perhaps you can you can correct me if I'm wrong, is there really was no need to consider a traffic signal for this development or elsewhere because traffic levels aren't high enough. Is that is that am I understanding you right? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council Shoemaker, that, that's correct. We we wouldn't be doing more calculations or studies on on that intersection of the second line because it's on a drive. It would, 
have to come through the direction from council, but, but I see no reason for it. And uh, thank you. And, and Mr. Spadafora touched on, um, I'm not sure if he was quoting from the Ontario traffic manual or uh, what he was quoting from, but he said that uh, exits onto arterial roads are, are not preferred uh, compared to exits onto collector roads. Is that the city's position as well? Is that, is that best traffic practices from a, from a traffic management perspective? Through you, Mr. Mayor, Council Shoemaker, that's correct. Uh, an intersection with a private development onto a major arterial road would not be preferred. Okay. Thank you. I have Councillor Hollingsworth next for questions. Councillor Hollingsworth. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor, um, I'm going to start with maybe Mr. Spadafora, please. So, um, yeah, thank ahead. you. Just out of curiosity, Mr. Spadafor, do you know if your developer, did they consider any other location or were they just totally focused on this location? For example, did they consider maybe the downtown area where density is more required? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hollingsworth, I know that this, uh, the particular developer has been looking at a variety of uh, locations. Uh, given the nature of the business that uh, he is in. Uh, this particular um, uh, property uh, was something that I know that uh, historically uh, he had been involved with uh, as part of the ownership group previously and then subsequently ended up owning that the whole of the property through the company himself. Um, and obviously it was with the intention of looking to grow and complement the previous development, condo development that he had, uh, that he did there previously over on the east side of, uh, of this property. So uh, it's, it's a continuous uh, monitoring um, role that this developer uh, has uh, employed, more different than any other, uh, any, anybody else that's looking to uh, perhaps get into um, these kinds of uh, units. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a second question for Mr. McConnell. Thank you, Mr. Spadafor. Through you, Mayor, to Don. Yeah, go ahead, ask, and we'll make sure Mr. McConnell answers it. Okay. Um, just to um, be more familiar with this area, can you touch on safety for our children that may be walking the streets? Um, on Donna Drive, are there currently sidewalks? Second thing, um, if this development does go through, um, did you say that there's going to be sidewalks for our children um, that need to um, walk uh, to play, to potentially grab a school bus, or so forth. Um, the safety issue is always number one concern for our kids. Mr. McConnell, can uh, can you please answer that question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Hollingsworth. Um, we did look at the at the traffic in the neighborhood. Uh, when we looked at the condition of the street, Donna Drive does not have sidewalks on it. Uh, however, the traffic levels are quite low and the speed of traffic appears to be quite low. Uh, you will have this situation in many, many other neighborhoods around town where you have children walking on the side of the road and everyone just has to be careful. I, I'm, I'm not saying this is, uh, I, I don't mean to dismiss this at all, but we have this exact same situation on many, many other streets in Sault Ste. Marie, including the street I live on. Okay. That brings me to a third question uh, through you, Mayor, again to Mr. Don McDonald. I can appreciate what you're saying, but I also appreciate that in wintertime, with lots of snow, the street becomes more narrow, hence there's a safety component. So can you comment, do you think that this particular developer or us as a city could consider a sidewalk in this plan to help um, families be a little more comfortable with their children uh, walking in this area? Mr. Mayor, the installation uh, through you to Councillor Hollingsworth, the installation of a sidewalk uh, along Donna Drive would be part of the city's capital works program. And we would make that determination uh, depending on need. And, uh, and that would be part of a budget decision. Okay. I apologize. I was more referring to the development. Is there going to be a, a sidewalk potentially in the new development? 
Mr. Mayor, I must apologize. I'm having great difficulty hearing Councillor Owens. She's specifically asking uh, if there's going to be a sidewalk in the development. Is there going to be a sidewalk in the developer's part of the development? In the yeah. new development, yes. Uh, no, but there will be a driveway. There is the, the only sidewalk that I'm aware of is a connection down to second line to make it more convenient for pedestrians. But uh, again, it's basically a long driveway. I don't believe there is any intent of having a separate sidewalk at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have Councillor Gardy. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Mr. Spadafora. Mr. Spadafora, I wonder. I'm wondering if you could elaborate at all on Mr. Ficacello's plans moving forward. Um, is, this, uh, is this development one that he uh, plans to own and uh, supervise um, in the foreseeable future or not? Could you speak to that at all? Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Gardy. Uh, I can confirm that it is indeed the intention of Mr. Ficacello to hold this uh, property. He will uh, develop it, hold it, and continue uh, looking to rent it out. Obviously, uh, that is his long-term uh, plan and vision, vision with regards to this development. Um, and I think it can keep with some of the similar types of developments and ownership that we see happening, not only in this particular instance, but south and westward, uh, Vivian and Connaught, uh, in the east end. It's very similar, given the nature of the development and the folks that typically avail themselves of these types of buildings. Thank you. Okay. So, Councilor Bruni, I'm not going to come back to you yet. I want to hear from Mr. Frisclani. You want to make comments? Before you make your comment, well, you can ask a question. But actually, I want It's a question that I wanted to ask. Yeah, yeah. you can ask it later. We've, we've asked a lot of questions. You, you've had a significant opportunity to ask questions. So I want to get to Mr. Frisclani because he's been waiting very patiently here. So we're going to, Mr. Frisclani, you're registered to speak to the application. I thank you for your letter. I thought it was very balanced. It wasn't clear to me that you were opposed to the application, so I don't want to you know, represent that, but we'll give you a chance to speak if you're speaking in favor of it, if you're speaking against it, or if you just want to make some comments about what you'd like to see, we'll, we'll hear from you now. I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor. I would say we're not either for or against this. Uh, we basically just want to have our voices heard and have some input and discussions with our neighbor-to-be. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this rezoning application. Like you mentioned, uh, our condo association submitted a letter to you, so I'm not going to regurgitate that letter. But I do have some important points that our membership would like to have on the record uh, as this project moves forward, so I'm going to uh, mention those now. Uh, as the letter states, I sit on the board of directors of Algoma Condominium Corp. Number 20, which is a nine-unit development located at 452 Second Line West, which is directly beside the vacant property at the center of this application. Uh, for those who aren't very familiar with condo developments, and not a lot of people in Sault Ste. Marie are because there aren't very many of them here, uh, our owners as condo owners pay monthly fees to cover costs such as lawn and garden care, snow removal, uh, private garbage collection. Uh, by law, a portion of our condo fees also go into a, a reserve fund that is used to pay for long-term projects down the road, and it's overseen by a reserve fund study, which, by the way, is also done by Tulloch Engineering, um, uh, that looks at the next 30 years of our condos and what needs to be done. So by law, we have to put a certain amount of money into that as well. The bottom line being is that we're very committed to the long-term maintenance and appearance of this property. Uh, and if you drive by our homes, I think it certainly shows. Uh, as we've heard tonight, these houses were built by Steve Piccicello's company, Ficmar. Uh, and I want to be very clear that our concerns over this townhouse development have nothing to do personally or professionally with Mr. Ficacello. Uh, in fact, he's owned the vacant lot uh, for many years across the way from us. Uh, he's been a very gracious neighbor during that time. I think it's important to put on the record. He's always ensured that the lawn is cut regularly during the summer. And uh, he's never once complained that some of our owners use the private property to walk their dogs or play with their kids. Uh, so that's not the issue. Uh, that being said, we do have some concerns. Uh, uh, that we hope are properly addressed as we move forward with this development. Uh, I have to say our first concern is that I'm here speaking to City Council tonight, essentially at the 11th hour, for lack of a better term, discussing things that should have been addressed much earlier in a much more casual atmosphere, I think. Unfortunately, we learned after the fact that there was a community meeting on January 13th uh, where neighbours were able to express concerns or ask questions to the developer and his representative 
Uh, as we now know, only two of the nine owners of our condos, and all nine of us are owners, were given notification, proper notification, that this meeting was taking place. And one of those owners happened to be away for the winter, so they didn't get it. So the bottom line is none of us knew, or the vast majority of us didn't even know this meeting was going on, and we didn't hear about it till after the fact. Um, the cities assured us this was a one-time mistake, and the problem was that MPAC did not have proper information about who owned these properties. You know, whatever happened here, whether it was MPAC, I believe the city's accurate when they're saying this was MPAC's um, mis- uh, this was MPAC's problem. They didn't have the proper information. But whatever the reason, it, whatever the, whatever happened here, the result is extremely uh, unfortunate and frustrating because our owners basically have to live with the fact that we were denied what is a legal right to voice our concerns much earlier in the process. And uh, I want it on the record, I think it's our opinion that City Council should be very concerned about this because uh, I want everyone to imagine this had happened to them, right, that you learn about a major construction project that's going to be built directly beside your house on the very same day council is scheduled to vote on the rezoning application. And then on top of that, we find out after the fact that there was a public meeting we could have attended in January to discuss a lot of the questions and concerns we have. Uh, I think everyone would be, would be as frustrated as we are. It's something that I still, it still bothers us today that we weren't able to do that because like, we're very reasonable people and we know Mr. Piccicello and we just would have, and I, I'm not saying it's Mr. Piccicello's fault that this happened, but we sure would have appreciated the chance to sit at this meeting and voice some of these concerns that we expressed in our letter. So that's something that we wanted on the record. Uh, and regardless of that, we're willing to move past that because it is something we can't change. It's not January anymore. Uh, I'm sure wish it was January considering everything that's happened since. Uh, but moving forward, what's important to us and what we're really hoping for are, insur- are some assurances that this rental townhouse development, which we now know is Mr. Ficatello plans to hold on to and not sell, that there's as much care that goes into this property, the maintenance and the upkeep as we have and our property as we see through the condo fees that we pay to maintain this property. Uh, In response to our concerns in the letter, the city has told us that this new development will fall under the same property standards bylaws as every home in the city does. In some ways, that's not very reassuring. We want to know if there's a way we can have further input on these kinds of issues moving forward. I mean, it's the same concern I think that any homeowner would have when something's being built beside them. They worry that it won't be maintained in the same way ours is. And it's an important distinction because it's not condominiums that are being built here that will have a condo board and an association and fees. It is a town, a rental townhouse development. And so it's a different, it's a different property. So we're looking for some kind of assurances that we're going to, that they're going to look the same, basically. That's a big concern for us. Uh, I think beyond that, as we mentioned in our letter, our biggest concern about this development is the property line. Uh, I'm no expert on construction. I don't pretend to be. But when completed, the end result of this project is going to be that the backyards of some of these units will directly face our front doors. And for obvious reasons, that's kind of a big worry for us. We're not sure what we're going to see when we open our doors. Um, So we're hoping to have something you know, that we can depend on that as per construction proceeds on this, that if there's something that our owners are satisfied, something that's done that we're satisfied that how, about how this dividing line will look, ensuring an acceptable level of privacy for both our owners and Mr. Ficicello's eventual tenants. If you look at the site plan, which I don't have in front of me, but if you look at it, we're specifically referring to the property line that divides the west side of our private road from the rear of unit six to 12. Uh, and again, I'm no expert. At this point, I don't think our condo association is 100% sure what the best solution is to this, whether it should be a fence or the right amount of vegetation. Uh, we're encouraged by the fact that uh, Mr. Piccicello has informed the city that he's willing to work with us on this for a, the right solution that everybody's happy with, taking into consideration issues such as snow removal and appearance. Uh, this is really what we're asking for. I think we're speaking loud and clear. We're looking for an opportunity to be consulted on this and to have our voice heard as we work as they go forward on this project. Um, some of the issues about the, for example, like the site, the site plan as it stands now shows small circles representing trees along the property line. Again, I'm no expert, but I don't know if those are 15, going to be 15 foot trees or two feet, two foot saplings. And the city has told us, for example, that the plan calls for quote significant vegetation, but we don't know what that means in reality. Um, the recent notice we received also doesn't include an elevation drawing of the proposed construction. So therefore, we're being, uh, we're being asked to comment essentially on a proposal which we don't really know 
the whole footprint. So I think that's where I would finish. I think we've been very clear. Our point is not to oppose this development. We know Mr. Ficcagello. We've been good neighbors for a long time. Our hope is to be able to work together and so that the project comes together in a way that we're all pleased with. That's good for both of us. And like I said, I speak for 14 Sault Ste. Marie taxpayers. I'm not just speaking for myself. I'm on the condo association. And that's really our hope here. And like I said, I think the big thing for us too is it would have been a lot easier. I'm still concerned about how it was missed, how seven of us were missed in the initial mail out for the initial public meeting. Those are my comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Frisclani. Mr. McConnell, do you have any, can you share any information with council on how seven of the 14 people that live in the condo development were missed? Just so there's clarity on council's behalf in that respect. Certainly, Mr. Mayor. We produce mailing labels for all the letters that we send out. We use the MPAC data to do that. That is the most current data that we have available to us. Unfortunately, in this case, their data was simply wrong. It was bad data. We did realize that just before council's February meeting and that meeting was deferred. So this is really the first time since then that council has had an opportunity to look at that. To correct that, what we did as staff was produce our own mailing list for the condominium corporation to make sure that all of those people did receive proper notice of tonight's meeting. It is unfortunate, but we use the best data that's available to us at the time. In this case, that data was not very good. I would like, Mr. Mayor, if I can have a moment just to talk about a few of Mr. Frisclani's other comments. I understand his interest in the project, having worked with Mr. Piccicello before. I'm very comfortable that we can bring the neighbors in to discuss the site plan and in particular the property boundary between the two properties. The details of landscape design will be worked out during that site plan process, including what type of trees, the height of the trees that will be planted, along with any fence detail. We do have preliminary elevation drawings. They were included in council's package, but we will receive final elevation drawings prior to putting that agreement into effect. And there would be no difficulty in sitting down with Mr. Frisclani or other members of the condominium corporation to discuss those details. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. I'm going to just, I'm going to read you a sentence from Mr. Frisclani's letter here that I think might just get to the heart of it. And I'm going to ask for your comment and Mr. Spadafore's comment on behalf of the proponent. All we're asking for is the opportunity to work with the city and the developer to ensure that these new houses do not do anything to devalue ours with privacy concerns at top of mind. It doesn't seem to me that we're beyond a point where the people that are here to speak to the proposal as represented by Mr. Frisclani are not without the opportunity to be engaged. So like from your perspective, Mr. McConnell, and from Mr. Spadafore's perspective on behalf of the proponent, what can we do to bring the folks in the neighborhood into the loop here and work with them so they feel consulted and they feel that their concerns are being addressed? We'll start with you, Mr. McConnell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think there's really two different parts because the concerns of the different groups are quite different. The concern of the condominium board just to the east of the property is very specific to the site, the details of the development. You know, what type of fences are going to be? How is it going to be stained? Where are the windows going to be in the elevation? Are people going to be looking at me when I wake up in the morning? That sort of thing. And we can sit down with them as part of the detailed site plan that gets developed and will be approved by the city before a building permit is issued. And I think most of council is aware the city also receives financial guarantees to ensure that it is built exactly as we agreed. Their details are very specific and we can certainly work with them. With regards to the neighbors in Donna Drive, while they probably have an interest in the details of development, I think their concerns are more basic with regards to traffic on Donna Drive and the lack of sidewalks on Donna Drive. That's a basic decision that council is going to have to make is are we going to allow access onto Donna Drive? 
okay. to go back and consult us, uh, consult further with them at this point. On the details of the development, it's fine, but I don't believe that is their major concern, Mr. Mayor. The second group of folks that are not in support, I understand. Okay, so Mr. Spadafore, can you speak to uh, uh, the, the, the issues that Mr. Fris Friscolani rose with respect to the details, and, and are you able to give him and Council some assurance that the developer will and can work with uh, uh, the, the homeowners that are concerned about those details? Thank you very much, Mayor Prime General. Yes, uh, uh, while Mr. Friscolanti was raising uh, the various questions that he had with regards to uh, things uh, like elevation, um, the proposed tree line uh, and fencing, what have you, uh, Mr. Ficacello indicated to me that he would be more than happy uh, to meet with uh, the condo corporation. Uh, to give them an idea of what exactly is planned there. With regards to, to that, uh, yes, he had considered even a fence along the lines of, I think, what Mr. Priscilanti had proposed, but thought that it may not be aesthetically pleasing for the, the owners to essentially open their, their, their grapes or what have you, their blinds, and look out and see uh, a solid wall in front of them. So I, I think that uh, you will... Uh, you know, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Friscolanti and to Council, I think you will find a willing, uh, a willing neighbor to, uh, to sit and meet and discuss. Okay, Mr. Friscolanti, do you have any further comment? I appreciate that. I'm not surprised that that was the answer, uh, knowing this individual, but I appreciate that. And I know that our, our association, uh, would, that's really what we're looking for. And I know, I don't, I, like I said, I'm far from an expert, uh, but I know that some of the owners uh, do have different expertise and different thoughts on this, and they would love the opportunity to sit and then have a meaningful conversation over this, and I think we'd be able to come to a mutually acceptable uh, way forward. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, so Council, we, uh, we're getting, we have a number of other applications before us, and we have other people waiting to, to, in the queue to speak to us. So I'd like to, to round this one out. Uh, there were some councillors that wanted to make some comments before we voted. I'll give you that opportunity. If you, if before you make your comments, if you have another question, please, but no more than one, because we, we have, I think, exhausted this topic, and I do think you have the information you, you need in front of you to make a decision. Uh, we'll start with you, Councilor Bruni, so whatever your question is, and then your comments, and then I'm going to move on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. To the developer, or to Mr. Spadafora, was there any consideration of having an entrance on second line and exit on Donna, which would reduce traffic on Donna. Was there any consideration? Great, Mr. Mayor, to, uh, to Councilor Bruni, yes, absolutely. That was considered. And? and um, yes, sir. And? It was considered. Well, that was your question, was it considered? He's saying it was considered. Okay, and now I'm asking, why wasn't it proposed, that's all? Well, I, I think he's spoken to this. He can answer again, but I think it had related to the expense. Is that the case, Mr. Spadaforo? Did I understand you correctly? So you, it was considered. Why wasn't it uh, ultimately decided to go in that direction? That's the question. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to ask uh, John McDonald on the engineering side to comment on that. Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bruni, uh, there was a number of issues which kind of uh, uh, was not favorably looked at for an entrance on the second line and Donna Drive at the same time. Uh, essentially, they're all the same as uh, any sort of entrance on the second line, one being a uh, local access onto an arterial road uh, negatively affects uh, uh, the usability of arterial roads, the speed of arterial roads, and general safety of an access on the second line. Uh, the second would be the location of uh, the various utilities, fire hydrants, hydro poles, uh, the need for us to locate the stormwater management pond at the downgrading end of the property. Uh, generally prevented any sort of um, reasonable or feasible uh, location for a road to work with the uh, concept of the, of the land. Okay, thank you. Uh, just my comments. Yeah, your comments, please, Councilor Bruni. Appreciate it. Um, for, well, first of all, I just want to state about Mr. Ficocello. He he does a he's a he does good work. Uh, he, he right presently he's on just off Third Line East with a, a major development there, and um, 
I have no problems with the development. What I have, my concern is with the residents in the, on Donna is the entrance and the exit on Donna Street. Um, but when Mr. Spadafora says that all concerns were taken serious and addressed, I beg to differ on that. The major concern when you had the town hall meeting was the entrance and the exit onto Donna. That was not addressed. Um, so the residents on Donna are all in favor of the development. They're just not in favor of the entrance and the exit. But funny thing is Mr. Ficocello in the past on the east side built these condos and he put the roadway on second line. People that have been living on Donna for the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years or longer, they were used to a school, bus service, the entrance was on from second line. All of a sudden now they have more vehicles traveling on Donna. So I ask Mr. Ficocello, counselors, everybody, if that roadway was in your neighborhood, that when you purchased your home, and now a roadway will be installed. Mr. Ficocello has installed a new roadway on Oguli, Old Garden River, Oguli Bay Road. And that came, uh, but that was already in the plans. This was not in the plans. When people purchased these homes, that have been living there for the last so many years. A roadway was not in the plans. So I asked Mr. Ficocello, the developer, uh, if you can work with the residents on Donna. I know it's a cost, but I hope you can feel for their, uh, for their feelings that they're not for the development because of the road. If the road was on second line, you would have nobody complaining about your development and they would support it 100%. But I believe you haven't done anything to show the residents in the area that you would work with them. And I'll leave it at that, thanks. Okay, I have Councilor Nero next and then Councilor Gardy. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just let me start with an issue that wasn't brought up this meeting tonight by either side, uh, but it was brought up at the neighborhood meetings and it did come up in a few of the letters and emails that we received. The, that issue was the issue of Donna Park. When we sold Donna Park uh, in 2019, uh, there were residents who told me that they had not received notification that the park was being sold. Um, we went through the process when we declared that park surplus. We went through our normal process, advertised in the Sioux Star, we put it on our website, and then we, we ended up selling the, prop, the property. Um, I brought this, I, I wanted to address this because I agreed with those residents at the time at the meeting in January and the people that wrote after that that's a valid concern. I mean, if we're selling a park, that we should make sure that the residents around that park uh, are, are notified. And they probably should be notified the same way that we notify people of applications of rezoning, a direct mail out. So after that meeting in January, uh, I brought this to PRAC, to Parks and Recreation, and I asked our staff to look at this, and they're going to report back to PRAC and eventually back to council uh, once they check this out to see if the process when we're selling a park could include, include the mail out uh, process as we do for applications. Just so that people directly abutting the park or using that neighborhood park definitely know that it is being sold. So I, I wanted to bring that up because it did come up a number of times. Uh, and we, I think we are addressing it. Um, we've certainly had a long time to think about this. One of the first meetings, as I said, was in January of 2020 of this year. 
Uh, it's a good development. I believe it's a good development. If, if we have a good developer putting it together, uh, there's a market for these type of units. And in general, the residents of Donna Drive do not oppose the development itself, and neither do I. They have a problem with the traffic that it's going to generate on Donna Drive. There were a couple of comments made by some of the residents in the correspondence that we received, both, both after that meeting and during that meeting, that I find very difficult in disagreeing with. And, and there's two points in particular. And the first point is that the property originally fronted on second line. Uh, it operated from second line and there weren't any issues. I, I don't believe it's fair to come after and say let's close the access on second line and let's make it go into Donner Drive. That's not fair for the residents, I don't believe. I also don't believe that would be my position if we were talking about two units or four units. But we're talking about a possible 22 units. And yes, there are traffic studies, and yes, there are car counts for vehicles going on to drive, Donna Drive. Those were taken. But it's very difficult to do a traffic study and actually come up with a number because of those repeat in accesses in and out of that neighborhood. Uh, so unless you do it very long term, you really don't get a very true estimate of how many cars are going to be, uh, how many vehicles are going to be generated that would be above and beyond the vehicles that are using Donna Park now. And the second point that, that I find difficult to, to get around is that the, uh, the numerous properties on second line both commercial and residential that have operated and continue to operate with access on second line. And these properties, especially the commercial properties, have much, much more or generate much, much more traffic than this development would. So I have a hard time uh, accepting that one. So I really believe uh, as Councillor Bruni said, I think this could go forward with no issues, um, site plan control and, and those kinds of things certainly is like every other application. But if we had access from second line, I don't think there would be any opposition to this at all. Thank you, Mr. Councillor Gardy. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm Forgive me, I don't mean to belabor it, but I'm stuck on I'm stuck in on this timeline of events and I'm stuck on the January 13th consultation that that residents in the uh, condo weren't aware of. And I'm, I'm I'm really stuck on another fact that I'm going to ask uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Friscolani. You said that you weren't made aware either of the February 24th uh, meeting till the last minute our city council meeting correct which thus kind of That's which thus kind of provoked us to defer it through you mr mayor to mr mcconnell correct uh, yes that was one of several reasons uh, that was part of it also the fact that they discovered the puc monitoring well mr mayor okay thank you but then you know i don't know we're seven eight months hence all of these developments and I'm wondering if through you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Friscolani, if Mr. Friscolani had the opportunity to make any overtures to Mr. For, to Mr. Uh, Ficicello about these concerns that he didn't have the opportunity to raise in the January meeting. Um, was, there, was there an opportunity? Were there any discussions between your condo board and Mr. Ficicello with the concerns that you're bringing now at the 11th hour, your words, not mine. No, that, that's right. That, those are my words, not yours. And no, we haven't. We followed uh, through the city. This is a city uh, planning division that's dealing with, and they have all the documentation. Sure. So we reached out, we reached out to the city. Uh, no, we haven't spoke to Mr. Ficicello. Mr. Ficicello has not reached out to us. Okay. And, well, that's unfortunate but, considering that they're, you know, these are concerns. You have a longstanding, it seems, relationship with Mr. Ficicello. And we're, we've gotten to kind of this point. Um, I, I, I'm concerned, as Mr. Nero is, with uh, 
this breakdown of communication between um, planning these matters and the constituents to which it affects. Um, I'm glad that you, Mr. Mayor, kind of helped uh, flesh out that, you know, the condo board specifically um, and what needs to be worked out with Mr. Ficacello probably can be. Um, you know, traffic, I look at it, best I understand, peak hours in the evening, 16 extra vehicles, I think that's what it said. Um, you know, communities evolve, parts of our community evolves, neighborhoods evolve. Um, I welcome this type of development in the city's West End. I just think that what this seems to have been plagued by um, were these breakdowns in communications and or opportunities for um, residents on either side of this development, if you will, um, to have a fair and honest dialogue about how it was going to impact um, the residents in and around that immediate area. I will be supporting it. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Hollingsworth. Thank you. Um, to you, Mayor, just for an education piece. Um, it sounds like everyone is agreeing with this development, which is wonderful. But it seems like people are still very concerned about where um, the traffic flow, Donna or Second Line. What's the process? Is there, if we say as council we believe in the development, but we want them to relook at the entrance, how can we make that happen? And it sounds like that's what it's boiling down to. Like, we don't want to defer this, but is there any caveat we can do? Well, you know, I'll, I'll let planning speak to that, but just from my perspective, Councillor Collins, I think we have to just correct the record. I, I don't think everyone agrees with the development because okay. the development doesn't go on a second line. So I think if the development on a second line, I think everybody would agree with the development, but the developer has that information and the developer has chosen to put the proposal before us, the developer has, so the development, the developer, as has been canvassed by Councillor Bruni, uh, uh, the developers decided not to go on a second line. So for whatever reasons uh, they've discussed or they've represented, uh, they've decided not to put that development forward. So that's not the development before us tonight. So like really, I mean, you're voting on the development that's before you, um, and they've worked with staff on this. So uh, I can let Mr. McConnell speak to this or the CEO speak to this, but if we send it back to them, we're defeating the development that, and, and we're sitting as a planning, in the, under the Planning Act now, so they need a decision from us. And if we're not going to be in favor of the development, they should get that decision, and then the proponent could appeal it. Or if we are in favor of the development, they should get that decision, and the people that oppose it can appeal it. But they need a decision from us and not a kind of, hey, can you go back to the drawing board on this? Because I think we should point out this has been before us a couple times now, and we've given it extra time. Um, and I th I'm positive and confident that a lot of the concerns that Mr. Friscolani has raised on behalf of the people that he's representing here can be dealt with through site plan, will be dealt with by our staff and by, by the developer. I think the larger issue is there's a second group of people that oppose the development because of the access and egress point. My feeling is, based on how we're sitting under the Planning Act and what's before us, we have to make a decision on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that'll go from there. Mr. CEO, do you have anything to offer on top of that? Are you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to council as a whole, no. Uh, you've uh, set the table for that decision. Council requires a decision on, uh, we require a decision from council on the proposal before you. Okay. So, council, do you have any more qu questions left? Uh, we have none. So did you read the, the, the motion, Madam Clerk? Can you read the motion, please? We're going to have a vote on this. I have a motion by... Sorry. Is someone speaking? It's been, yeah, well, this, is there somebody that is on the line that I didn't get to that is on the line to speak to this? Have I missed anybody that's on the line to speak to this? Yeah. No? Okay, go ahead, Madam Clerk. I have a motion by Councillors Scott and Dufour, resolved that the report of the senior planner dated uh, February 12th, 
24, 2020, concerning rezoning application A120Z be received and that Council rezone the subject property from single detached residential zone and parks and recreation zone to low density residential zone with a special exception to reduce the rear yard, second line, setback requirement from 10 meters to seven and a half meters, that the property be deemed subject to site plan control pursuant to section 41 of the Planning Act and that the legal department be requested to prepare the necessary bylaw to effect the same. Okay, so uh, all in favor, so I can, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Opposed? So the motion ca uh, carries, uh, Councillor Hilsinger? Councillor Hil Hilsinger has uh, voted remotely. I'm just waiting did for- Did Councillor Hilsinger vote in favor so the people at home- Yes, can. she did. So it was eight in favor and three opposed. I'm waiting for uh, Councillor Dufour. He's in favor. So it passes eight to three. That's correct. Okay, thank you for everybody who uh, took the time to uh, participate with us today and uh, it had, thank you for your patience. We're gonna move on to the next matter on our planning agenda, which is 7.7.2 Old Garden River Road. Uh, Mr. McConnell, if you could please give us a synopsis of this uh, application. And the applicant is Andre Riappel. He's also joined by. I see Mr. Riappel there. Make sure you leave him on mute until we're ready for him. <laughs> Okay, so do we have Mr. McConnell? Okay, so we'll just uh, ask everybody who's watching for their patience. So Mr. Riepel, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but we're having some technical difficulties and we need our planning director on the phone, so we're trying to uh, make that work. So we appreciate your, your patience. You look pretty relaxed and comfortable there and uh, just sit tight, we'll be with you shortly. Appears to me, Mr. CEO, that for the as difficult as it, it might be, and I know you had these conversations with APH about having delegations here, we might have to look at the logistics of moving to that model. Yes, I agree. We canvassed that with APH. Delegations being here, but it, there were some logistical challenges with having to clean everything between the different delegations. So uh, we're going to have to revisit that. Five, actually. Tonight might be the first time in a long time that we have to pass a motion to go beyond our... Uh, uh. Do you want me to get you another space ship? Do you want me to get another space ship? Okay. 
Okay. She might be hearing us on Saturday. Should we should we just adjourn for a minute? Yeah. So, Council, can I have a motion to uh, take a, a, a ten minute recess so staff can work on this? Council Shoemaker, seconded by you. For all in favor. So we're going to adjourn for 10 minutes. For everybody watching at home, we're going to adjourn for 10 minutes. Andre, we'll be back in 10 minutes once council sorts us out.
Just that we're going to, do we need a motion to resume the meeting? Or can we just get back into it, Mr. CAO? We didn't adjourn, actually. Well, we did. I, I, I did. Did you? Yeah, I did. So we should have a motion. So, so can I have, uh, we'll have uh, Councillor Hollingsworth and Councillor Bruni uh, to resume the meeting? All in favor? Motion carried. We are at 7.7.2170 Old Garden River Road. We have Andre Riappel on the line. We also have the planning director, Don McConnell, on the line. Uh, Mr. McConnell, I'm going to ask you to give council and the folks watching at home or listening at home the opportunity to uh, explain to them what this application is about, and then I'll go to Mr. Riappel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this, prop, uh, this application concerns a uh, small piece of property on Old Garden River Road north of Second Line that immediately abuts the existing Velarusian property. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it abuts the Velarusian property on two sides, both to the west and to the north. Uh, it is owned by Mr. Riopel, uh, who also owns the Velarusian property, and what he would like to do is rezone the property commercial to match the zoning on the existing Belarusian property. It is his intent to merge the two properties. So there would be a consistent commercial zoning. It is recommended by staff. Uh, we have only received one piece of correspondence from a neighbor and it's from the gentleman who lives across the street and it is in support of the application. Uh, Mr. Riopal, I understand, is on the phone um, uh, and is able to speak to the application if council should have any questions. Okay, so Mr. Riopel, would you uh, like to speak uh, in uh, to the application? Mr. Riopel, can you hear me? Mr. Riopel, can you hear me? So while we're looking for or connecting with Mr. Riopel, I'm going to give staff and the not staff, sorry, council the opportunity to ask any questions of Mr. McConnell they may have on this application. Council, do you have any questions on the application? Uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, did we have anybody that registered to speak in opposition to the application? Not for this one. So we have no one registered to speak in opposition to the application. You have no questions of staff on the application. Did any of you have any questions of the applicant on the application? So I, f I feel like we're in a position to vote on the application, uh, which is unfortunate because the clerk has left the meeting. Uh, if I can have her back, please. So, Madam Clerk, uh, we we uh, have uh, no. <laughs> I have opened it to vote. Okay, so uh, we had no questions in the application. <laughs> All in favor. Motions carried. The application's approved. Councillor Gardy? No, thank you. Councillor Dufour? Councillor Scott? Are we in affirmative? Councillor Christian? I take it everybody's in the affirmative? Yes. Everybody was in favor of the application. So we are going to uh, move on to 7.7.3 of the uh, planning section, uh, Great Northern Road, Caswell, and it's Caswell Concrete. Uh, and Mia Carella is uh, participating on behalf of the applicant. Okay, Mia, can you hear me? It's Mayor Provenzano speaking. Yes, Your Worship, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. McConnell, you're on the line. Yes, I am, Mr. Mayor. And Mr. McConnell, can you give us a summary of this uh, Planning Act application, please? Certainly. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this application concerns a very small portion of the Caswell Concrete property on Great Northern Road, north of Fifth Line. 
Uh, is Mr. Caswell's intent to rezone to permit the construction of a cold storage building on this property that will be used to store, uh, basically provide weather protection from the large wooden concrete forms that they use. Uh, we have not received any objections to this application and Ms. Corella is on the line uh, on behalf of the applicant should council have any questions. Okay. I do council, councillors, Ms. Ms. Corella, did you, you're on the line on behalf of the applicant, did, did you want to speak to the application or were you just here to ans answer any questions? I, thank you, Your Worship. I think Mr. McConnell has pretty well covered uh, everything, so uh, I don't have anything more to add. Okay. Council, do you have any questions for either Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell or the applicant through the applicant's council? <laughs> Seeing none, Madam Clerk, can you confirm for the record that nobody's registered to speak to or speak in opposition to this application other than the parties that we have available to us right now? That is correct. Okay, we can have a vote on the application then. All in favor? I, Sorry, oh, Madam Clerk. I have a motion by Councillors Scott and Vezo Allen resolved that the report of the senior planner dated September 14, 2020 concerning rezoning application EA20Z be received and that Council rezone the portion of the subject property as shown on the maps attached from rural area zone to rural area zone with special, exce with special expe exception to permit the construction of an 18.3 meter by 30 and a half meter cold storage building subject to the following condition that the storage of chemicals or petroleum products within the cold storage building is prohibited. All and that favor. is open for voting. All in favor. The application is approved. Thank you, Your Worship, and members of council. That is my only business before council, if I may be excused. Thank you very much. It's nice seeing you. Yeah, take care. And under agenda item 7.7.4A 9020Z, 12 Fish Hatchery Road, um, Jan Rubel, on behalf uh, or representing the applicants, is on the line. Jan, this is uh, Mayor Provenzano speaking. Can you hear me? Oh, they're just calling in, so they're not yet on the line. Okay, so Mr. McConnell, can you give us an... an... Jan, is that you connecting? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. McConnell, can you give us a summary of this application, please? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. This application is for the former uh, Old Apostolic Lutheran Church, which was on the corner of Fish Hatchery Road and Landslide Road. There aren't any proposed changes to the building, simply to the use. And Mr. Rubel's uh, application is to permit the sale and service of bicycles, skis, and other non-motorized equipment, as well as permitting food services. This is basically uh, to permit the sale of skis and bikes. Uh, this application is recommended for approval. As I mentioned, there won't be any changes to the property itself at this time. Uh, and the applicants are on the line should council have any questions. Okay, uh, Jan, uh, did you want to speak to the application? Um, yeah, so basically we're, we're looking to move the store to the 12th Shaftery Road. Um, we think that it'll, it'll benefit uh, basically the recreation in that area being uh, uh, Hiawatha Highlands. Um, for cross-country skiing and, uh, and mountain bike, um, as well as uh, it being a, a prominent cycling route um, uh, to get north uh, through town. Um, we, we think that it would be a very uh, very nice location for, uh, for the current store. Okay. Uh, Council, do you have any questions for staff or for the applicant? If I can have the clerk or the deputy clerk confirm that no other party is registered to speak either in for or against this application. That is, that is correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so we have uh, comments. So we have comments from Councillor Shoemaker and then comments from Councillor Bezoal. Go ahead, Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to uh, uh, give my you know best regards to this project. I think uh, uh, the bike shop's been successful where it was, but uh, I think having it, you know, at the center of the action, so to speak, where uh, most of the bi biking is done done in town, the recreational biking uh, is is a you know I think they the applicants obviously think it's a good business move, and I think it's great for uh, you know for trail enthusiasts out there to have something uh, like this nearby. So uh, kudos to them. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Bezuel. 
Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, Jan, is it going to be open year-round like Valrusian is currently? Uh, sorry, I believe the question was whether it will be open year-round? Correct. Y yes, absolutely. And are you going to be doing rentals as well or just sales? Um, so it would be, uh, currently we do some, uh, some rental bicycles. Um, mm -hmm. We don't do any other rentals. Uh, outside of that um, in kind of ski gear or anything like that. It's not something that we've talked about um, uh, currently uh, in, in providing. I, I don't know that there'd be a, a benefit to us uh, providing um, ski rentals or anything like that with Hiawatha Highlands already um, arguing to that, uh, um, that clientele and the right. is being sold um, at, the, at the Kinsman Center currently um, acting as the trailhead. Well, I just think it'll be a great addition in making uh, Hiawatha Highlands a destination, and uh, we really value your uh, investment in that area. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody else want to, to comment on the application? Happy to support this application myself. Uh, we can have a vote. Um, Madam Clerk, you uh, you please read the uh, the motion. And the motion we'll by Councillor Scardi and Dufour resolved that the report of the planner dated September 14, 2020, concerning official plan and zoning amendment application A920 ZOP be received, and that Council approve official plan amendment 228 by way of a notwithstanding clause to the rural area land use policies to permit real retail sales and food service on the subject property and rezone the subject property from rural area zone to rural area zone with a special exception to permit the sale and service of bicycles, skis and other non-motorized outdoor equipment and food services, reduce the front yard landslide road setback from 30 meters to 10 meters for the existing building only, reduce the exterior side yard fish hatchery road setback from 15 meters to 8 meters for the existing building only, permit parking to be located no closer than 15 meters to the required interior side yard and no closer than 10 meters to the required front yard and that the subject property be deemed subject to site plan control pursuant to section 41 of the planning act and that the legal department be requested to prepare the necessary bylaws to effect the same and it is open it's open for your voting council all in favor for the folks watching at home any opposed seeing none it completely passes uh Jan, your application is approved Thank you so much. No problem. Take care. Thanks for your patience. Under so we, we will move on to 7.7.5. 7.7.6. Sorry, 7.7.6. Yes, application A620Z. It's 21 Garden Avenue. And we have on the line uh, Daniel and Alyssa Perry, the applicants. And we have registered to speak Charlie Murray, Lori Bloomfield, and Lori Barbo, all of whom I understand are on the line. Okay, so we have all those parties on the line. Uh, before I ask the uh, Director of Planning to give us a synopsis of the application, I just want to thank everybody on the line for their patience and forbearance. And we've, we've dealt with the technical issues that we have. We appreciate it, and I assure you all of you will be given an ample opportunity to speak to the application. Mr. McConnell, if you can start and give Council a pre a summary of what this application is about, and then we will go to the proponents of the application. Uh, certainly, Mr. Mayor. This application is for a vacant lot uh, on the south side of Garden Avenue. The request is to rezone the subject property from single detached residential to low density residential to permit the construction of a semi detached building. Uh, it is being uh, has been reviewed by staff and is being recommended for approval. And Mr. and Mrs. Perry are on the line and are also able to speak to the application. Okay. So we'll go to the applicants, Mr. and Mrs. Perry. Do either of you want to speak to the application? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is Dan Perry. Go ahead, Mr. So, Perry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to discuss our application. Uh, basically, to echo Mr. McConnell, our intention is for the property uh, is to build a single-story semi-detached dwelling. The majority of the homes on Garden Avenue are bungalows, so we thought that a single-story dwelling will fit the character of the neighborhood nicely. We plan to have my mother move into one of the units and rent the other unit to an individual or couple who are looking to downsize or do not want to live in an apartment. And uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Um, before we move on to the folks that are on the line that want to speak to the application uh, and... I wanted to give council an opportunity to ask any questions that it may have of staff or the applicant. 
and then we'll move to uh, the the uh, other proponent, other people on the line. So uh, we have Councillor Christian who has some questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to either Mr. Perry or uh, Mr. McConnell. Um, being that it was a, it's essentially a single family residential area, was the original, the original plan to develop that vacant lot to put in a single family dwelling? Um, Mr. Mayor, it's, it's Mr. McConnell here. The only uh, one, who, uh, I understand that, that the lot has been vacant for about 10 years now. Uh, Mr. Perry is the only one that has approached us with regards to a development plan, and uh, that was for uh, semi-detached development. Uh, Mr. Perry may be able to comment if he had considered other types of development er earlier. Mr. Perry, did you want to... Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Christian, uh, when we originally purchased the property, my wife and I, we were open to pretty much any option at the time. Um, but while, while I guess looking at our options, we decided that semi-detached made the most sense for our situation. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. McConnell, uh, through you to Mr. McConnell, Mr. Mayor, um, what is the purpose of reducing uh, the parking spots from three to two? Does this have anything to do with the size of the lot and the footprint of the buildings themselves? Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, through you to uh, uh, Councillor Christian, uh, no, basically what it is is to allow for more landscaping in the front. Uh, the applicants will have, uh, both of the, of the two semi-detached units will have a garage, so there will be one place to park the car. They could park a second car in the driveway if they needed. And by limiting it to uh, one required parking space per unit, it increases the amount of landscaping. Okay, thank you. Now, I, I noticed that the, the development will be slab on grade. Mr. McConnell, is there any concern with drainage? My, my recollection is that the properties abutting from behind are slightly elevated uh, from the proposed development. Is there any concern with drainage in the area, especially since we're looking at slab on grade? Through you, Mr. Mayor, at the time of the building permit, uh, that will be reviewed. It will also be reviewed in advance of the building permit uh, as part of a site plan agreement. Okay. So that the grade of uh, the drainage will be reviewed by our engineering and building departments prior to the issuance of a building permit. Okay. I just have a couple more questions if I could. <clears throat> now, I see, Mr. McConnell, that the frontage was reduced, the requirement rather, was reduced from 18 meters to 17.5. Does that have anything to do with the side yard setback requirements? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Christian, no, the, the side yard uh, setbacks remain the same. So, so the fact that, um, that we're, we're putting two buildings on what used to be a single family lot is, is not a concern as far as the space provided? No, these are not large semis. Uh, the bylaw requires 18 meters of frontage for two buildings and, and uh, what is being requested, the existing lot is 17.5 meters. That's a difference of about 20 inches or 10 inches on each side. Uh, and that just results in a slightly smaller building. It doesn't affect the actual setback from the side yard at all. Okay. And <clears throat> anecdotally, I heard that, that um, neighbors were notified by way of a letter. There was no formal open house for the neighbors to ask questions, get clarification, or uh, voice concerns. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, we, uh, our, and our normal practice has been over like the last year and a half, two years, to uh, require neighborhood meetings of the applicant uh, before we bring an application to council. But with the COVID-19 uh, situation, uh, we have suspended that. Okay, I think that's that, it for me, Mr. Uh, a number of people would be hesitant to come to a meeting, and we have not had a uh, neighborhood meeting since January. Thank okay. you. I think that's it for Councillor Christian. I have mm -hmm. Councillor Scott uh, has some questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Uh, through Mr. Mayor to Mr. McConnell, uh, just one question, and I can appreciate if you may not have an answer to this, but have we approved similar projects in the past to, uh, to this? Yes, as a matter of fact, at the August meeting, Council approved a, uh, a similar development on Selby Road for a semi-detached development. Great. Thank you. That was all my questions. Okay. Councillor Hollingsworth and Councillor Bruni. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor. I'm not sure who from Public Works is on the phone, if it's Ms. Hamilton Beach or Mr. Larry Girardi, but um, my question is with regards to the, um, the street and the infrastructure. Is it Mr. Girardi on the phone? You just ask your question and we'll, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll get it answered. Okay. Um, can you comment on the infrastructure of this particular street? Um, it's my understanding that within the last year, there's been a couple of challenges with the street, such as a sinkhole, um, and I believe there's a current challenge right now that Public Works is working on, and hence, our, do we need to worry about um, overloading um, this small street's infrastructure, aging infrastructure? And the second question, approximately how old is the um, infrastructure? To you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the councillor, um, as far as the street's concerned, this is just a standard street uh, that can accept, certainly, uh, you're only making the addition of one extra residence on the street. So from a traffic perspective, there's no issue. From infrastructure perspective, there still is no issue because, uh, quite frankly, you're not adding much to the system. And as far as concerns with the area, the only concerns I've, uh, I'm aware of in that area, there were some water quality issues, but uh, PUC has also addressed those. Okay. Um, actually, there was um, pipe damage a few months ago that required a full dig, and there's another current concern um, that's being dealt with. Uh, my other question... Go ahead, Councillor Holl Hollinger. Yeah. Mr. Drury, Th thank you. Just thank you. Ahead. My other question to uh, Mr. McConnell, through you, Mayor. Yep. Uh, to you, Don Ms. Um, McConnell, you mentioned about not having neighborhood meetings because of COVID. Um, I was under the impression, did you consider doing a Zoom meeting? Uh, no, we didn't. What we did in, ex in, in exchanges, uh, we have up, up to increase the amount of information that's included with a mailed notice to include a site plan and some other details so that the neighbors have a better understanding of what is being proposed. And then, uh, you know, the neighbors are always welcome to, to contact staff for whatever questions or other additional information they may need. Okay. And Mr. McConnell, just out of curiosity, um, because of COVID, did you give a longer extension of deadline for people to get back to staff, knowing that uh, COVID was um, changing uh, people's, you know, day-to-day -day routine? Did you extend the deadline from the normal deadlines that we give? No, the deadlines are actually set out in regulations passed under the Planning Act. We did mail out a, a notice to all of the property owners uh, on Garden, as well as a number on Gravel and a number on Queen Street on August 24th. Okay, thank you. And my last question, uh, if I may, to through you, Mayor, to the City Clerk. Um, can you give us an update? How many letters uh, did you receive for... Um, in support of this, and how many letters or emails did you receive in um, against this? Uh, all of the correspondence that uh, was received is attached to the agenda. Um, if you want me to count them, you're going to have to wait because what pl planning put uh, the package together, so I'll have to count those individually. Okay. Oh, I, I don't think you have to count them. The councillors have all of them. They do. Yeah. I, I can appreciate it. But for the viewers at home, and especially for our constituents that um, are listening to Shaw, I think uh, for their own um, understanding, I think that's why I'm asking the questions for the viewers at home. Yeah, you can also say the number. I mean, if, as opposed to making the clerk go through and count them, if there's... Okay. So, can I have a number, like 13 letters, was it? There 12? are several letters in opposition. I do not have any letters in support. Okay, of so it seems more than 10 anyway. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Bruni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, question to Mr. McConnell. Um, was there a, a blueprint provided or 
showing to the residents in the area what the two semis would look like? Uh, no, there's just a site plan. I don't believe we have a drawing uh, as to the elevations of those buildings at this point. No, uh, we don't have that uh, at this point. Wouldn't that be we beneficial? Have a, we, have a, we have a site plan as to where they'll be located on the property. Yeah. Wouldn't it be beneficial for the residents in the area to, to see a kind of a photo of what the two semis would be looking like when it's built? Again, I, uh, it's not required for the, at the rezoning stage. It will be required at the building permit stage. Uh, while that may be helpful to the uh, yeah. to the residents, that was not provided to us. I don't know if Mr. Perry has any additional information on the details of, of the development, other than that it's a one it's a single story building with an attached garage. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate. It. Thank you, Councilor Dufour. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I just have a process question about um, applications under the Planning Act. As we sit here and as we um, consider an application, um, are, are we allowed as a reason to deny uh, an application uh, area property value impacts? I'm going to have planning answer that question as opposed to me. Uh, planning, uh, could you please answer that question? Is that Mr. Mayor? That, that, uh that is an argument that has been made at the OMB many times, um, and it is, um, can, I mean, council can hear this argument from people, but the evidence is, depending on what's happening, property values may not go down. In many cases, property values go up. If you're in a neighborhood and someone's coming in and, and spending significant money on your street or in your neighborhood on a development, in many cases that derives the value of all the properties up. So I've found that the OMB just, in my experience with them, uh, they don't consider this. They just don't take this into consideration at all. I, I think the question to be specific was, is it an appropriate factor for council to take into consideration when it makes a planning decision? I would look and I, and I, I would say uh, it, the, it would be the same as the OMB. I think the, the evidence on this is very mixed and therefore I would suggest that council not take this into consideration. Mm -hmm. Well, also I think council would have to have evidence mm -hmm. to take it into consideration as opposed That's to an correct. expression of opinion. And then just as a follow-up question, if I may, Mr. Mayor, are, are we allowed to discriminate between uh, rental and, uh, and home ownership uses of housing? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to answer that question. The, the answer is absolutely not. We cannot consider, council cannot consider when they're making a decision, either the tenure of the property, you know, is it a condo, is it a rental property, is it privately owned, or who lives there. You can only deal with, it's a semi-detached, you can only deal with the nature of the building itself. Excellent, thank you very much, Mr. McConnell. Okay, Councillor uh, Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to, uh, I guess it would probably be Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell, uh, you've noted in your comments a couple times, this is a one-story building, correct? That's correct. Um, each semi is only one story? That's correct. And if someone wanted to build something on this property under the current zoning, which is, as I understand, single-family residential, or single-detached residential, sorry, uh, how high could they build? They could build two stories, and it could be a tall two-story building. Which would be, how many feet is a tall two-story building? I don't, I, uh, how tall? I don't have the number right in front of me at the moment, but it would be, I mean, you could easily build a two-story building on this property in, in conformity with the zoning. And from your uh, understanding of what's being proposed here, I realize we only have a site plan, but is the use... Um, more more passive than what's currently allowed or more aggressive than what's currently allowed as in how how much of the property is being used compared to how much could be used under uh, under the existing zoning well i i think if you first look at the use it's a very modest increase it is instead of having one one unit we're going to have two units here uh, but we know in one of those units and there's no assurances of this moving forward that it's only going to be occupied by one person uh, you know, is, is that a more dense use? Yes, just a single family house. But the, the difference is very fuzzy. And uh, the ability to go in and build 
a, a much larger single family house is there. I mean, the, these, these people are, with the proposal, they'll be under the minimum requirements for landscaping on this property. And uh, I mean, obviously, uh, the, under a single family uh, zoning, you know, I, I suppose there's probably no limit on how many people can live in it of, of one family, right? Yes, basically you can't, you can't really zone to the number of, of people that are, are living in a building. Um, I, and I, I must apologize, I misspoke. What I meant to say was they're well within the minimum setback requirements that the zone allows, particularly with the rear yard, uh, and they will provide more landscaping than the minimum zoning bylaw requirement with the, with the development that's being proposed tonight. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so council, before I get to comments, is there any more, because I want to get to the folks that want to speak in opposition. So if there's any more questions for the proponents or for staff, go ahead, then we're going to get to the folks that want to speak in opposition. So Councillor Nero. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Quir Mr. Mayor. I have one question for Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell, um, most of our applications in the recommendation include uh, subject to site plan control. It's not in this one, is it, because there is nothing significant that has to be approved tonight? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council Nero, generally we don't, we don't use site plan control on single family developments. We also don't use site plan control on semi-detached developments unless there's some particular reason to do that. In other words, are we meeting a particular problem? Is there something that needs to be addressed? If it's just another semi-detached development, that's very similar to a single detached development as far as the impact uh, on, and I know the neighbors are going to disagree, but on the neighbors, on the services, on the traffic. So we, unless there's a specific reason, do not use site plan control on semi-detached developments. <clears throat> there, <clears throat> Mr. McConnell, there was one letter from the neighbor, and, and I haven't pulled it up yet, but it referred to the building, the proposed building being too far, too close to the front yard, and they would lose their view to either side. Was that something that would be dealt with under site plan control or at the at the permit stage would that be corrected that would have to be dealt with at the zoning stage here uh, and if you if you look at it the setback that they're proposing is what the zoning bylaw requires it's very close to the what is on both sides of them basically if you do a line from the front face of the building to the east to the front face of the building to the west this new development will abut up to that line. In other words, they're all going to have the same setback as you drive down the street. Okay. The difficulty with taking a building and setting it further back on the lot is now you're getting into people's privacy in the backyards because now part of the building is looking into people's backyards. So it's preferable to have it designed as it's proposed tonight. So everyone has basically a very even uh, oh. front yard setback from the road. Okay, so I, I must have misread that that concern because I, uh, if it's in line with the rest of the, the homes, then that's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No problem. Okay, so we have a number of people that want to speak in opposition to the application. So on my list, I have Charlie Murray, Lori Bloomfield, and Lori Barbo. I'm just going to start at the top of the list. Mr. Murray, can you hear me? Are you on the line? Yeah. So, Mr. Murray, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, feel free to speak to the application and uh, express uh, your uh, thoughts, opinions, and concerns. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Listening to the planning board, uh, Mr. McConnell and such, and talking with our neighbors and residents in this area, I have a number of concerns from all of us. And it is 100% backing on this. Our concerns, number one, and it's not number one on the list, it's just a concern. Traffic concerns on a dead end cul de sac pose the threat to our children as it is. With school buses, rerouted traffic, 
travel the length of our street from Queen Street because there's disruptions there a lot. Being a dead end street cul de sac, we get numerous, numerous times where traffic is circling around to get back to go the proper way if there is construction or whatever going on Queen Street. Adding this duplex on would already add more traffic on the street. The infrastructure is very limited and the increased demands will only catch up more. History has shown us that. This application would impact house and property values, which I argue that I heard earlier here in the statement, in a very sought after purchasing area. We, the residents, were not informed of this application personally, and putting it in a weekend edition of a local paper, which is not even delivered on our streets at all, is not how it should be done. It's like it was said, yes, we understand the COVID thing, but to just kind of sneak it through on a weekend edition is not the way it should be done. We should have been told up front on this. This is a safe and beautiful neighborhood that was zoned for single family dwelling. And there is no need to change that now or in the future. The planning board or whoever should not just follow paper directives, but include the human element affected. I have a history with low rental housing. Not that this would be a low rental housing, but I certainly have a history with it in the lot beside me when the house was rented out. A good majority of the residents on our two streets have lived here for over 40 plus years without any problem over housing or how or who was moving in. We are a very close community here and the only battle we have ever faced ridiculously is against our own city. Residents' opinions should count loudest, not paper directives and plans. In closing, I would like to express that this is the will of all the residents here, and I think as representatives of your wards, it is your duty to listen to these residents when they have a very legitimate concerns that affects them all personally. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Mr. Murray. Uh, we will move on to uh, Ms. Bloomfield. Lori Bloomfield, are you on, are you on the, uh, the call? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. We can hear you well. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and good evening, Mr. Mayor, Councillors, and sitting officials. I'm Dr. Lori Bloomfield, a professor at Algoma University. I'm one of those people that you often discuss your council meetings and city planning sessions. That is... How do we get our youth to stay in or come back to Sault Ste. Marie? I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, and although I moved away to complete my education, I came back. I had two choices in 2007. Take a postdoctoral fellowship at McMaster University in Hamilton, which likely would have resulted in my finding employment in Southern Ontario or elsewhere, or take a tenure-track position at Algoma University and return to the city I grew up in and loved. I think you know what choice I made. I grew up on Adrian Drive in the East End, street consisted of both single-family dwellings, which I lived in, and semi-detached or duplex houses. I knew in moving back to Sault Ste. Marie that I wanted to return to the East End, but to a more family-friendly location. My husband and I have been at Teen Garden Avenue for 13 years and have raised our now 11-year-old daughter on that street safely. This area is zoned for single dwellings, and as a homeowner, a taxpayer, and a contributor to this city in my role as a university professor, I find myself quite disappointed that a decision we made 13 years ago, some of my neighbors made 20, 30, and 40 years ago, to live on a street that is exclusively single dwelling, may now be taken away from us and them. I'm also unhappy with the proposed layout of the house. It doesn't fit in with the character of the neighborhood. If you have not ventured down Garden Avenue, I invite you to do so, and you'll see the lovely yards and houses, and you'll certainly notice that this is a very small lot, not suitable to the proposed structure. The garages will be jutting out toward the street and will occlude Charlie Murray's view from his bay window, and this structure, therefore, appears too large for the small lot. 
considering it's a dead end street for every vehicle that drives on the street, two trips are necessary going down and coming back. There are about 16 houses on the street and adding two more residents, two additional driveways and two additional garages could result in four additional vehicles, which represents an approximately 17% increase in local traffic. Not to mention the possible increase in the number of school buses, currently at three, but could potentially result in a total of five. That's a 40% increase on a dead-end street. On a small dead-end street, these traffic issues are certainly concerning to all of us. These issues only become exacerbated in the winter when snowfall significantly narrows our street and the turnaround at the end of the street is narrowed due to snow dumping. Also, I worry that should you approve this rezoning, there's going to be significant concerns with respect to the message you're sending to the citizens of Sault Ste. Marie that they can build what they want, where they want, and use it how they want. There is a reason for specific zoning. The fact that the applicants have to ask for exemptions to the R3 zoning specifications indicates that this property is clearly not suitable for the semi-detached dwelling. I ask that you reject this rezoning application and invite the property owners to build a single dwelling structure as the current zoning permits and join us as neighbours on Garden Avenue. Finally, I want to thank you for having carefully reviewed the letters of opposition that you would have received from the following Garden Avenue and Gravel Street neighbours. Myself, Barbo, Boston, Burns, Caparossi's, Corrado's, Davis's, The Edwards, Callas, McGauley's, Mitchell's, Murray's, Orizetti's, Parks, Sarlow's, Tattashore's, the Vaughn's. I've just listed for you almost every resident on Garden Avenue and Gravel Street South who will also be affected by these concerns. We all hope that you will take your citizens' thoughts and consideration seriously as you render your decision. As Mr. Irwin may say, do you have the CISO or the guts to say no to one family, the applicants, or would you prefer to disappoint the 17 families that have reached out with their opposition? I would certainly hope that you do not simply rubber stamp this application and take the time to consider it as you did tonight with the other applications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bloomfield. We will go to Ms. Barbo. Uh, are you on the line, Lori? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay, the, you're welcome to speak. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I don't want to repeat any of the concerns that have already been expressed to my neighbors, Charlie and Lori, but I do want to address um, a concern that I have regarding the uh, lack of neighborhood meeting. I understand in the report that COVID-19 pandemic was cited as the reason for this not taking place. I, I certainly get that, but here we are. Tonight we're discussing the issues by another means that does not involve face-to-face -face contact. The neighborhood should have been presented alternatives whereby we could collectively raise and discuss issues of concern prior to this council meeting today. My second concern uh, relates to the report, uh, the planning report. Mr. Patrick Lowe prepared a report on September the 3rd, 2020. Um, Yet, the, on the notice of the application that was mailed to us, we were allowed to have input until September the 14th. So in Mr. Lowe's report, he's only including minimum input from the residents and neighbours. There were no examples given of similar zoning approvals where approval is in a neighbourhood that closely resembles Garden Avenue we could have compared and reviewed related issues. In fact, this report was prepared prior to the full submission of neighborhood concerns. No reasons of benefit have been given that would encourage support of this application. Please don't vote in favor of this application. It has no benefit to our neighborhood. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, thank you, Ms. Barbo. Uh, so we're going to give you know uh, council any opportunity to ask questions who, who that that arise out of those comments. But I, I'd like to start with a couple myself, uh, Mr. McConnell. Uh, the, there was one thing that I, I focused on. There's a few things I focused on. One of the, the well, comments that we've heard a few times is this issue of, of notice and receiving notice and. Uh, you know, the, the matter that was specifically raised is that we published notice in the Sioux Star 
Uh, and it doesn't, and this isn't a criticism of the Sioux Star, but I think the issue is that it doesn't have as wide of a viewership as, say, Sioux Today does. So do we, do we simply publish notice in the Sioux Star? Do we not publish notice in any other forums? And if we don't publish notice in a forum like Sioux Today, uh, why wouldn't we? Because we know that that's got a, a far reach in our community and, and it's likely to get a lot of eyeballs on an application. Can you speak to that? Oh, certainly, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I want to start off by saying I agree with everything you just said. The regulations under the Planning Act, when they're talking about giving uh, uh, notice, require, and these regulations I point out are quite old and perhaps should be reviewed, uh, one of the options is to uh, give notice in the, uh, the daily paper of the area. So we have done this for many years. We also know that this is not the most effective way to do things, which is why we, uh, and this is not a Planning Act requirement, we mail personal notice to everybody who lives within 400 feet, well, 120 meters or 400 feet, everyone who owns property within 400 feet of where the application is. And we have beefed up the amount of information that we're giving to people as part of that notice. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I do agree that I think that this is an appropriate time to sit down and rethink about moving forward. What is absolutely the best way to give notice on these things? I'm still convinced, Mr. Mayor, that mailing a letter to somebody gets their attention. Okay. Uh, you know, not everybody reads everything all the time. Uh, but certainly staff would be happy to sit down and look at what our options are on this uh, and uh, come forward and, and, and perhaps recommend some additional uh, efforts that could be put forward. Well, I'd like, I'd like your insight on another point too, because as Councillor Dufour has landed on in his, I think his question, or maybe it was Councillor Scott, we've approved very similar applications in the past. Um, and I think in your report, in, this, in planning's report, this is, it's called, like, it's a, a light intensification or a gentle intensification of, of, of the neighborhood. Um, so we've, we've approved similar applications in the past. When I read this application, I thought back to Simpson Street when we had a lot of neighbors from Simpson Street here concerned about the uh, essential townhouses that were going to be developed there. And those have been developed and uh, they're nice and I think the street has accepted them. Um, but the difficulty I'm having is I recognize that we have to sit here under the Planning Act, essentially as a quasi-tribunal, and make a, a legal decision based on planning principles. But I think Mr. Murray makes a relevant point in that he's saying, like, there is a human element to this. And I've been the mayor for six years, and I don't think I've had an application before us in six years where every single house on the street opposed it. So if we're council and on a planning basis, we uh, should be supporting this decision in accord with your recommendation because that's the right kind of planning principles. How do we balance that with introducing something to a neighborhood that the neighborhood is uh, indicating it is disappointed in, right? So like it's, there's a real, it, we have to balance this because I think you have to be sensitive to the feeling in the neighborhood because I think one of the, you know, one of the things you don't want to see is a new property owner develop in a neighborhood and that be a negative experience for that new property owner and the neighborhood. So like, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Like, you know, I, we, in, in the six years I've been sitting here, we haven't had this specific circumstance, but I'll be just quite frank with you and the people that are listening at home. Like when I reviewed the application, uh, I thought of the other ones that we approved that were similar and I didn't see really any planning grounds to not approve it. Uh, so, but it's, we're, we're in this difficult position of really not having a planning ground to, to not approve it. Uh, and knowing that they're there and this, I'll be honest, this is, this is my neighborhood. So like, you know, I, I live very, very close to garden. So I consider these people, my neighbors, um, and this house would be moving into it. And I personally have no personal objection with that. I do think it is gentle intensification. I don't think it's a significant deviation. Uh, from the overall neighborhood, uh, although it is a deviation. Uh, so I don't have a problem with it, but I find it difficult in the context of the entire street objecting to it. So like, what, do you have any comments or insights or uh, thoughts on that? Two thoughts, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one is when we're, when we're looking at an application of development coming in, we always look at what's the impact on the neighbors. That's part of this. 
okay? And the neighbors have raised some issues that they're concerned about traffic, they're concerned about infrastructure, they're concerned about property values, they're concerned about the appearance of the thing, they're concerned about perhaps other issues as well. But it is only one additional unit. It is only one additional unit. And whether you're talking sem semis or single family development, that's all very low density development. And from staff's viewpoint, and you know, we have to we have to consider the provincial policy statement on this. For the people who aren't familiar with it, the provincial policy statement is a document that the province prepares that covers a wide range of issues that says when municipalities, or particularly staff, are making a recommendation and municipalities are making a decision, they need to pay attention to this. And part of it is to provide for a full range of housing types and to integrate them into the community, and in particular to support infill development. If this was a huge development on a small lot, staff would recommend against it. But it is only one lot which does implement the provincial policy statement, and I believe May, it will have minimal impacts on the neighborhood. Having seen this many other times in the past, yeah. I don't mean to dismiss the concerns of the neighbors because I know those concerns are real. But at the end of the day, we're talking about one additional unit, building two instead of building one. Yeah, I don't I, know if that helps you, Mr. Mayor. In a limited way. I mean, I, I personally didn't, wasn't, I didn't see any evidence that the traffic would be increased substantially or that the infrastructure on the street would be taxed or that the property values would go down. I'm familiar with the street. I, I think the property values are helped by a nice new structure as opposed to a vacant lot. What I was concerned with and preoccupied with myself was the argument that this is inconsistent with the neighborhood because the neighborhood is single family dwellings and this is not a single family dwelling. Your answer to that, I think, is that it's not significantly inconsistent with the neighborhood because it's a deviation of one unit as opposed to more than one unit. And Mr. Mayor, if I may, this is why council has to hold a hearing on making these decisions. Yeah. It's an opportunity to hear from everyone, the developers, from staff, from the neighbors, and make a decision based on what you believe is best. Okay, so do we, council, do we have any questions arising from any of the opponents to the applications uh, other than the ones that I asked? Um, Councillor Hollingsworth, go ahead. Can we do comments? Well, we're, if we don't have questions, I am going to go to comments for sure. Yeah, so we see no more questions, so we're going to go to comments. We'll start with the, the ward councillor. So, Councillor Hollingsworth, you had the mic. Your mic's on. I'm going to start with you. Okay. Thank you. First of all, I just wanted to um, say thank you and express our appreciation to everyone that lives on Garden Avenue who has taken the time to um, rally together who took um, basically precious time to write a letter, um, who spoke tonight and um, reminded us of the human touch, the human nature. I think um, you coming to us this evening, uh, coming to us for the last number of days, um, helps us to remind us of um, what this community is all about. We need to listen to our constituents. The other piece I want to touch on is that um, it seems like all neighborhoods usually ends up with one leader. And um, I think Mr. Murray um, was our, the leader for this particular um, neighborhood. And um, being a, a counselor for this area and listening to their comments, listening to um, reading their emails and text messages over the last two weeks, um, I can assure you that Garden Avenue, every person that lives on the street is not opposing to development. What they want is just one single family home. That's all they're asking for. If it was one single family home, there would be no issue. Um, so it's not that they're against having that lot um, be developed, but they just rather have one single family home to go with the whole look. And the other piece to reiterate is that the whole street, the whole neighborhood is opposed to this. Thank you. Council Christian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanna start off by thanking, as Council Hollingsworth did, the neighbors who took the time to express their thoughts, and especially to those people that spoke tonight. They were very articulate. 
um, very concise in their views. And, and I also want to thank uh, specifically Charlie Murray because Charlie and I go back a long way on issues. Um, he's very passionate about the things that he believes in and clearly spearheaded this, this effort. So I thank them for that. Uh, when you're talking about your neighborhood and the people around you, it's an important issue. And, and we all know that there's a housing shortage in Sault Ste. Marie, and especially when it comes to uh, rental units, we have a lot of incentives in place to develop rental units. I understand that. And I also know that there's an Ontario directive and a policy statement that we need neighborhood intensification. But I would point out, and, and, and the mayor kind of touched on this, you know, these guidelines are guidelines. And quite frankly, the, the legislators who put this in come from Southern Ontario where neighborhood intensification and proper use of land uh, is paramount. We're talking about Sault Ste. Marie here. Um, and so I want us to keep that in mind. We're talking about a small dead-end cul-de-sac in Sault Ste. Marie, which was clearly pointed out most of the residents there have lived there in excess of 20, 30, and 40 years. Again, they're not, they're not opposed to development, but surely when you buy property, you have an idea of what you're buying into. And although this might just be one additional unit, it's still not a single family uh, property. Um, and, and the thing, and when you talk about intensification, we have intensification in that end of town. Um, you simply have to look beside the golf course now, and, and we have two townhouses going in on that property. Um, but that's Queen Street. If you look down at the other, towards Bellevue Park, we have the townhouses that went in about 10 years ago. Again, it's on Queen Street on a major thoroughfare, on a ma major artery, and right beside them are multifamily units. So now we're asking that a multifamily unit go into a quiet East End Street. Um, I agree with the mayor. I, th I cannot turn a blind eye to the overwhelming um, opposition to this. Yes, we've, we've had um, opposition to some degree to any development. But this is unanimous. And for me as an elected official in that ward to simply turn a blind eye to that, I, I, I don't feel I'm serving my constituents properly. My final point is it's become clear that communication uh, is important in these developments. We see it again here with this one. I'm not suggesting that anybody who's opposed to this may support it had they had the opportunity to ask questions and view the drawings, etc. But communication always helps, and we saw that in the first application. I understand we have COVID, but we need to find a way to accommodate the concerns of people because as we try to grow the community, we still have to listen to the people that are paying the taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Christian. So we're gonna go with Councillor Gardy and then Councillor Shoemaker. Um, thanks, Mr. Mayor. A um, Couple things that I'm gonna reflect on here, uh, or that I reflected on is the both the, those in favor and those opposed uh, spoke this evening. A couple of things. Um, I've heard this a few times over the course of the last year and a half or so that I've been around this table when it comes to planning matters, people reference school buses. That's something I just outright dismiss um, for the sheer fact that I want people to remember that school buses and their traffic are indicative of young people being in the community and you know providing a sense of vibrancy to neighborhoods. So I, I, that, that's not something that I really pay that close attention to. Um, I don't see this being a traffic issue either. Um, it's one additional dwelling, as Mr. McConnell has pointed out. I think Mr. Councillor Bruni um, you know, raised a very good point. It seems that a, an architectural rendering or a sketch of, of the physical aesthetic of, of the building isn't required um, to come before us in these decisions. Um, it would certainly be helpful. Um, to us and uh, maybe to those who are in the neighborhood. And um, as Councillor Christian said, this communication piece, 
coming from us um, it seems to be lacking. And, you know, we kind of have to embrace some more, I would think, 21st century uh, methods of, of communicating um, when these meetings are, um, what's going on, um, because we all say how much we're going to engage the public when we're walking around knocking on doors. But then when it comes to sitting around this table, um, there's evidence that that's not necessarily the case. All that being said, I also sat here an hour or so ago and um, supported a developer who was doing a much broader project um, where concerns were a number of those on a quiet street in the West End uh, were concerned about traffic. And uh, I supported the developer. Um, this is in one additional unit in a quiet East End street, um, which I will, uh, I will also support, but uh, there's some work to do around these things. I concur with a couple of my colleagues. Thank you. Okay, we have Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's, um, I, w I didn't intend to speak, but hearing some of the comments, I, I do feel the need to. I know that uh, this council uh, doesn't uh, oppose light intensification in areas of single family residential uh, neighborhoods on dead end streets where the parking requirements are being uh, reduced and the setbacks are being reduced. Because at the last meeting, it's in our minutes today, which we just approved about three hours ago, unanimous in favor of the rezoning on Selby Avenue, the design was even the same except the location of the garage which is on the inside uh, in Selby Road rather than on the outside uh, on, uh, on Garden Avenue. Every member who's here tonight supported that. Almost identical application. Reduction of the parking spaces from three to two. Rezoning with minimal uh, change of the setbacks. Uh, rezoning from a single residential to a, uh, a semi-unit. So the only difference that would cause us to change our mind tonight is the opposition of the neighbors. In my opinion, and I think in, in the Planning Act uh, uh, capacity that we sit, that is um, uh, uh, a proper planning application that we've all proven that we support in the past. So I don't see any reason as a planning uh, body how we could reject this. And, and I think uh, that if, if uh, anybody votes against this who voted in favor of Selby Avenue last time, it is ideologically inconsistent. Those are my comments, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Shoemaker. Uh, Councillor Hollingsworth, you've spoken to this. So there's, there's no, like, there's no kind of back and forth. Like, well, let, let me finish, kind of, if anybody else has comments. Does anybody else have comments? Councillor Hollingsworth, you had a procedural question? Yeah, just procedural. Um, for those that spoke, the three individuals that spoke tonight, um, do they have a chance to rebuttal? Do they have a chance no. to, since they've been listening to this conversation? No. They don't? Okay. No, that's not, we, we've never operated that way at the okay. planning. So again, that's why I was just asking. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, uh, I'm just gonna make a couple <laughs> comments. I think Councilor Shoemaker makes what to me is the governing point here. Uh, as, you know, I was trying to kind of talk to Mr. McConnell about um, the, govern the, the issue we really have to be focused on is whether this complies with the Planning Act. And I feel that similar planning applications were in front of us, and I referenced that earlier, and when they were, I voted in favor of them. Uh, I know it's a disappointment uh, to a neighborhood when the entire neighborhood is, uh, feels a different way about the application. And I would agree with Councillor Gardy that I think we could maybe do a better job of getting a message out. Uh, I personally think that on top of Sue, the Sioux Star, we should be advertising in Sioux today. And I think that would really bring people's attention to these matters quicker. Uh, and as much as, you know, I don't think any of us wants to disappoint a number of neighbors, uh, when we sit here, we sit here under the Planning Act and there are legal parameters on the decisions we're making. And uh, those legal parameters are relevant to the decisions we have to make. And, and because of that, I will be supporting the application. So, Madam Clerk, uh, if we've read the... I have not. Can we read it, please? 
I have a motion by Councillors Scott and Bezel Allen resolved that the report of the junior planner dated September 14, 2020 concerning planning application A620Z, 21 Garden Avenue be received and that Council approve the application by rezoning the subject property from single detached residential zone to low density residential zone with a special exception to reduce the required parking spaces for the semi-detached dwelling from three spaces to two spaces and reduce the required lot frontage from 18 meters to 17 and a half meters and that the legal department be requested to prepare the necessary bylaw to effect the same. And that is open for vote. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries nine to two. Eight to three. Eight to three. So the, who was the third opposed that I missed? Councillor Hilsinger. Okay, Councillor Hilsinger opposed. Sorry, Councillor Hilsinger. So Councillor Hilsinger voted in opposition. So that brings us to the end of the planning agenda. So that brings us to the beginning of the consent agenda. Uh, and Councillor Scott had asked that uh, 611 be... Um, separated from be, consent. 611 will be pulled from consent. Okay, Council, do you have any matters in the consent agenda? Council Gardy, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, to commence here, uh, could I start, could I commence with uh, 6.1 uh, quickly, Mr. Mayor? Quickly, Mr. Mayor, through you um, to, I guess, maybe CEO White or the um, city clerk. The outstanding council resolutions, there are a number of them that are uh, scheduled to come back in the quarter four of 2020. Um, I'm just asking if that are, if those are still kind of realistic timelines, would you say, uh, Mr. White? Through Considering you, all that's gone on. Forgive through me. you, Mr. Uh, Mayor and Councillor Gardy, uh, we are taking that into account. Uh, the uh, list was circulated to staff and uh, adjustments made to some of the timelines. Uh, that being said, we have a few reports that are ready to go on a number of the uh, resolutions, uh, but uh, certainly with that meeting like we're having tonight, we didn't want to overload uh, the meeting. So you will see a number of those uh, come on an, even on an accelerated basis than the timelines outlined. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Anybody else on 6.1? Okay, Councilor Gard, do you have anything else? Um, I do have a question on, uh, I do have a question on 6.5 would be the next, which is the, uh, oh, sorry, the twin pad, the twin pad arena. Go ahead. So my, I might have like a comment, then a question. Is that sufficient or should I not? You've got five minutes. Okay, there we go. You can waste it however so, you like. As a, so, uh, I, you know, I think... We were all disappointed by um, the decision f uh, of the provincial government not to uh, approve this project um, to be sent to the federal government to see if we could access um, the funds that we asked for. Um, as I read it, it said that projects that were nominated to the federal government for review and approval were those that, quote, most closely aligned with the provincial assessment criteria and federal requirements. The provincial assessment criteria, including reviewing projects based on community need, community support, lack of similar services accessible nearby, operational and financial capacity, value for money, asset management planning, um, and whether the projects were open to the public and efficiencies through joint projects. So as I go through those assess th th those criteria from the province, I would have to say check, 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 check. Okay? So that's my first um, bit of uh, an issue with us not being, being approved. We all know in this community that our infrastructure when it comes to ICE facilities is aging. Many of them are aged. Um, we are going to get to a point over the course of the next number of years where those in our vicinity and those within our community are going to reach the end of their lifespan. Simultaneous to the fact that, you know, ice usage, um, for a myriad of reasons, not just hockey, um, is on the upswing. 
we have a building by, you know, my kind of assessment of things and speaking to different people is one critical event from um, potentially not being able to house much of any activity. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very, very disappointed because um, I'm very confident had the province selected this to move forward, we have, would have had as good a chance as any um, through the federal through the federal government and its uh, its criteria. I have a question through you, um, actually to either you, Mr. Mayor, or through you to counts or to uh, CAO White. Over the course of time, subsequent to us passing this motion and choosing it as our most uh, our most uh, um, important project that we wanted to put forward, did you have the opportunity? to uh, present this to the province at all? Did, was there a, a delegation of you that had the opportunity to speak to anybody involved? Um, I know there's often opportunities offered. I was just wondering if you had the opportunity to follow through on any of those, if they were offered. It looks like the CEO wants to answer this, so we'll... <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Gardy, there were a number of times that uh, staff has uh, lobbied uh, the province on this uh, project. Uh, including last year's AMO conference where Mr. Bear and I were able to make a delegation to the parliamentary assistant. Uh, we had the minister uh, directly overseeing this program in town and toured them through the McMeekin Centre. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, also uh, reached out to uh, the local ministry staff and had a meeting with them to uh, explain the uh, project in more detail. And we were set to uh, raise it again as a delegation at this year's AMO virtual conference. However, it was the just prior to that uh, conference that we learned that uh, our request wasn't being nominated. Thank you. Um, through you uh, to Mr. Mayor, to Mr. White, and or to you, Mr. Mayor, in any of these meetings, whether they be however they were virtually or in person prior to um, the pandemic. Did you receive uh, support from our local member of provincial parliament? Was he in the room for any of these delegation meetings? Um, was he a part of those meetings? Uh, yeah, we, we, there was a meeting in city hall uh, that it wasn't, that we met about city priorities mm -hmm. and identified it as our top priority and reviewed uh, our, our priorities is the municipality with our member of provincial parliament and his chief of staff. Uh, and there were connections and outreaches by city staff with our MPP's office and chief of staff. So, uh, yeah, it was, our, our MPP was aware that this was the city's top priority and there were communications and lobbying on that front too. Good. Um, I'm, I'm glad that there was. I'm very disappointed, as you can sure I've, I've kind of conveyed. Um, it's an important project that uh, we were all looking forward to. Um, that property in the West End needs an arena, and I will uh, I'll leave my comments at that. Thank you. Councillor Shoemaker, 6.5. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, uh, am fortunate enough to sit on the Twin Pad Committee with Councillor Gardy, uh, and I believe Councillor Christian. Um, and, and needless to say, we're all, I think, and I speak for the whole committee when I say we're all disappointed that uh, this didn't get approved. I, I'm, I'm hesitant to characterize the McMeekin as a health and safety risk uh, because we're still, we're still using we're it. We're still operating it. Uh, but is it fair to say the place is or is very close to being a health and safety risk for, to the community, Mr. CAO? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, uh, well, we certainly wouldn't operate the facility with any health and safety uh, uh, risks that we knew about and or that were imminent. It is getting more and more difficult to make sure the uh, facility can operate without health and safety risks. Uh, certainly you're referring to the carbon monoxide leak uh, we had some time ago. Uh, certainly we uh, go through the facility and take every step we can to make sure nothing like that is going to happen. But with a facility that it's uh, beyond its serviceable life, it gets more and more difficult to uh, operate in that fashion, in a safe fashion. 
Yeah, I, I am referring to that uh, incident, and and our MPP was was the counselor for that area when when that uh, took place, and and was very vocal about uh, the need to replace that building at the time. So uh, I I hope that he will use his current position to. Uh, push along uh, a reconsideration of this project or or consideration of a different stream of funding from the province for this project because uh, when he was in this seat, uh, it, it was a priority for for, uh, for his constituents then. I think it's still a priority for his constituents. So um, is do we have any indication of other arena projects uh, in the north that got approved or denied? Do we know, Mr. CAO? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Shoemaker, uh, while we've seen no uh, listing or reference or material that notes which projects were nominated, we have been following uh, communities that have announced, like us, a denial of their uh, projects and not being nominated. Well, all I have seen is in Northern Ontario is that there is a twin pad project in North Bay and I have not seen any reference to their ISIP application being uh, denied. Okay. So we don't know if, if the North Bay project's been approved, but we haven't seen that it was denied. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. It, and we should note that really it, we wouldn't see an approval of a project until the federal government's approved it, right? Because it could be forwarded by the provincial government to the federal government and not approved by the federal government. So and then it's not an approved project, right? So it'll, it'll take some time to see ultimately uh, you know, what is approved and isn't. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's helpful information. Um, do we um, have any other options? I, I realize that, that that's kind of the purpose of the report, but yeah. do, we, do we expect... Uh, my, my, my guess is that no other funding source uh, was as uh, significant, potentially significant, as, as the one we've now lost out on. Is that correct? I, I don't think we've been able to d identify any other funding source, but it's, it's clear to say that there was no other funding source as significant as the one that we've lost out on, if yeah. there is another one at all. Mr. CEO? That's correct, Mr. Mayor, uh, <clears throat> but we are certainly exploring anything, and uh, we did use our opportunity in our delegation to AMO, uh, we were aware that uh, it hadn't been nominated. We did note that uh, only about 10% of the uh, projects that were applied for did receive a nomination on to the federal government. We noted to the uh, province that that's obviously an indicator of the need uh, for these types of projects and the need for uh, either another stream intake application for this funding or some sort of uh, forthcoming program that uh, could uh, help out maybe not exactly the same parameters as this past one but uh, and uh, as the report notes we will be back to council uh, at the second meeting in October with uh, further information and uh, some options and decision points for council to make. Okay thank you Mr. CIO. I've Councillor Scott on 6.5. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just noting in the in the report, and uh, I'm not sure if we have Mr. Vare on the line. Um, I was just kind of curious about the the mention of the ice plant. Um, do we know estimate in time how much longer of a lifespan that ice plant has? I don't know if that would be through uh, to Mr. Vare if he gets on the line, and if not, then to Mr. White. Mr. Vare is. Mr. Mayor? Yes, through you, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Scott. Um, we don't have a, an, an exact uh, timeline uh, related to the ice plant. Certainly, it's it's beyond its expected life now, and the team's doing, uh, I think, a fantastic job of keeping it going. Uh, we have experienced failures, and they've been doing some innovative things to uh, to keep it going. So, I would definitely say that uh, it's on its last legs. So, would. <laughs> Conveniently, would the COVID situation have extended its life a little bit to give us some more time for exploring options, or is it one of those things where it could go at any point? 
Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Scott, um, we could experience a failure at any point. Um, we typically open the McMeekin Arena later, um, just because we like to open it when the weather is cooler. Uh, so COVID didn't buy us much time, unfortunately, uh, in that respect. Okay. Uh, that was everything for my questions on that item, but just as a quick comment, I, I would like to see this project move forward. I have the utmost faith in the committee and, and staff to bring back options. and. Uh, I think it's important to have, not only for the community, also for the West End, to have those kind of facilities. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing some of the options in the future. Councilor Bruni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to Mr. Ver, will the McMeekin Center be open this year with, the, well, this winter because, and due to the pandemic, would that be closed? Is the hockey organization gonna be starting up through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Bruni, uh, yes, we do plan on opening uh, the McMeekin, and uh, the hockey organizations are uh, beginning their programming, and uh, it's it's a vital um, it's a vital resource for us in in meeting the demand and the hours that we have from the uh, the different stakeholders. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a, a quick comment. Um, I do like to see the Twin Pad Arena. Uh, I don't want to see it reduced to a single pad. I think we fell short when the John Rose was built, and we fell short when the uh, GFL uh, uh, Entertainment Center was built. And I don't want to see a single pad. I want to see a twin pad arena. I hope staff comes back with some good recommendations. Thanks. Okay, Councilor Christian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My two questions were, were uh, asked and answered but I do echo Councillor Bruni's thoughts. I, I think we need to be uh, looking to the future and I hope that one of the recommendations, strong recommendations, is a twin pad arena in the future. Thank you. Councillor Nero. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A question for Mr. Ver. Uh, Mr. Ver, I, have, uh, I certainly support this uh, report tonight. I'm looking forward to it coming back so we can make that final decision. Um, in the meantime, do we have a plan in place should the arena uh, have to be shut down for any reason? Like, and I know right now that, I mean, we don't have a full hockey program per se because of COVID. Uh, but as we get out of this pandemic and we get back to regular ice time, hopefully soon, um, do we have anything in place or do we just wait till something happens and say, well, we don't have any more ice time? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Nero. Um, uh, while we're hoping the uh, the arena is uh, up and running, certainly, um, you know, staff have looked at uh, different ice times and are discussing if it should go down, you know, what would be our approach. And so we're working on different options there uh, to have something in our back pocket if that event does occur. And Mr. Ver, just to follow up, would this be done in collaboration with, with the user groups of that facility so that they know that should something happen, their ice time is curtailed and they can carry forward with whatever plan you come up with? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Nero. Uh, yet yeah, certainly we, um, we don't want to alarm everyone. Uh, you know, we're hoping the arena will go ahead. And, um, you know, it, it's something, uh, it's a good suggestion. Perhaps um, we can start um, discussing the options that staff have identified with the different user groups in this event. Um, so that um, should that happen, um, at least people will be aware of how it may impact different groups. Certainly, it, it takes some time for staff to develop, and uh, we'd want to minimize the impact to any one user group in particular and, and try and make sure we spread out uh, the pain, if you will, across different stakeholders. Great. I, I, I think definitely think that's the way we, we should go. I mean, you're telling us through your report tonight that there may be problems that arise uh, because of the condition of the arena that may that it may have to shut down and I firmly believe that the user group should be well aware of that once they go into their seasons uh, at whatever capacity they're doing them at uh, that they may lose their ice time because of the facility failing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have Councillor Hollingsworth next and Councillor Dufour. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor, to uh, Mr. Vare. Um, 
first of all, I understand women's hockey has been canceled because of COVID this year, this season, which is too bad to hear when um, the women's hockey was making such a strong presence in our community. My question to Mr. Vare. Um, refresh my memory. Um, when we were first talking about this, did we at first talk about having a partnership with um, another group in this um, city to build this arena jointly? Wasn't there some um, discussion about that? Was that explored? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Hollingsworth, um, you may be referring to um, Sioux College. They had approached the city um, to uh, locate one pad on their campus. However, in our discussions with them, there wasn't any, um, you know, funding or investment in the arena at that time other than a commitment of the ice time. Okay. Mr. Vare, um, now that things unfortunately have changed, um, and of course Sioux College may have changed, you know, funding always changes, is there an appetite, is there a possibility that you, staff, or someone can maybe approach Sioux College again and have this conversation, or with any other partner? Just because, obviously, things have changed around financing, is there an opportunity? You never know. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Hollingsworth, uh, in our previous report to uh, Council that analyzed the different options, certainly our recommendation was to uh, try and establish a uh, twin pad arena at the existing um, site. Um, you know, pending our investigation for different funding options and um, uh, opportunities, uh, we'll have to come back to Council looking at everything uh, on the table and, and see uh, what the opportunities are for the for the twin pad. I think that's still our original uh, hope and goal. Um, and then barring that, uh, we'll look at every other option we can. Okay, that's fair. I hope that maybe after tonight's discussion, um, there could be partners out there in our community that might come to you, Mr. Vare, and say, um, how can we help? You never know. It could be a partnership here, opportunity. Thank you. Okay, Council Dufour. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, looking at this report, um, I, I, I feel um, strongly that uh, you know this capital expenditure is probably going to be one of the single biggest ones that uh, that this council ever undertakes um, in the course of our term. And 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 I I just like to see us um, make sure that we're able to have uh, no undue time pressures on, on the decision. And so I'm, I'm wondering, Mr. Ver, have we examined the option of of adding improvements to some of our outdoor rinks for the coming um, at, at least two seasons, even, even if the project does go forward? Um, have, we, have we considered adding uh, better lighting, better change rooms, things like that to some of our outdoor rinks that maybe aren't being as utilized as much as they could um, for the next two seasons as a way of, of mitigating the risk of the McMeekin going down um, while still ending up with, uh, with a municipal asset that, that, that will continue? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Councillor Dufour, um, we haven't really explored that option. Um, the, um, the, the, I guess one of the key issues with that is, is the variability we've experienced in weather on different seasons. Sometimes we have great uh, weather that for outdoor rinks and other times uh, we haven't. Uh, and so when we have user groups uh, you know, committed to ice time, et cetera, uh, we hadn't really looked at that option at this point. What about even something like uh, what we've seen Mr. Porco and what I know uh, uh, Mr. Lamming's done with their outdoor rinks, uh, adding a roof shelter, things like that, that would make it more feasible for, uh, you know, maybe not necessarily a hockey league, but at least some of our user groups um, to be able to make uh, better and more sustained use of, of the outdoor rinks that we have. Um, it, you know, I, I, I guess I don't need a total answer here. I just, I think it might be something that um, perhaps the committee might want to take up to examine as a way of, you know, obviously incurring some expense, but uh, of a magnitude far, far less than $27 million as a way to, uh, to, to do something at least this year while we continue to examine uh, options to make this very important and consequential decision. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other comments on 6.5?
Councilor Gardner, do you have any other comments on consent agenda? Any other matters on consent agenda? I do not have any other matters on the consent agenda. So I have Councilor Scott next in the consent agenda, and then once he's through his matters, Councilor Shoemaker. I'm going to ask you a little, Councilor Gardy, as the acting mayor, if you can just give me a few minute break here. So, uh, Councilor Scott, it's with you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I guess now to Mr. Acting Mayor. Uh, just a quick question on 6.7, the Millennium Court Ravine, and I realize now that there's a conflict, so I don't know if he can be the acting mayor. <laughs> if I have a question on 6.7, Councilor Gardy. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. So you know what? I, I can wait until you're back. And that's my only other. So can we, can we proceed past that item? That's my only other item. Can we come back to you on that when he's That here? would work for me. Cool. So, or thank you, Councillor Scott. Um, items on consent, uh, Councillor Vezo Allen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Mayor. My one item is 6.4. I don't know if Mr. Lamming is on the line or would be Mr. Vare. So my question is uh, concerning the uh, transit um, environmental assessment that needs to be done so that we can have a um, public consultation concerning the potential relocation. Has there been a plan for this consultation and uh, what is the, the processes by gaining um, some community feedback? Good evening, Mr. Mayor to Councillor Vezo Allen. Yes, this uh, recommendation tonight is to select the proponent that went through an RFP process and uh, Tullock's being recommended to do this on uh, the city's behalf. And uh, the one thing that should be noted is that this would be eligible for ICIP funding so that we would actually pay uh, approximately $10,000 of the $40,000 cost. So just to be clear, Mr. Lamming, first we will get the environmental assessment to determine whether or not the property is viable, and then we will have the community consultation? To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bezal, and yes, as part of that process, uh, there will be consultation uh, as, as the EA process unfolds, uh, things like such as traffic assessments, noise assessments, review of the cost and emissions, review of the structure, those types of things get, uh, get covered in this EA process. And Further to that, what is your plan in terms of community consultation with um, our current situation with COVID? To you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Rezo Allen, there's a good chance that this will be done by virtual uh, consultation, and uh, Telec is uh, aware of that, and they put that as part of the RFP process, how to uh, consult with the public uh, through, that, uh, through that open process. Is there a possibility that we can have um, surveys and feedback actually at the existing terminal for our ridership and make sure that it's accessible in terms of whether they need print copies, um, emails, and to ensure that we're actually capturing people that use transit on a daily basis by engaging with them in a safe way at the terminal that's existing right now on Dennis and Queen. Through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Vezel, and yeah, as part of the process, it is identified within the RFP that surveys is one of the options that will be uh, will be covered as part of the EA process. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Lamming. I have no further questions. Thank you. Anybody else on that matter? If there are none, we'll move forward. Um, does anybody else have anything else on the consent agenda? Councillor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. Um, 6.12, the builder's risk insurance for the West End Sewage Treatment Plant. Uh, through you, I guess it would be to Karen Fields. I mistakenly uh, sent a, this question to our director of engineering over the weekend, didn't hear back. So I apologize for not sending it to you, Ms. Fields. Um, do you know if any of the other bids on this uh, project included the builder's risk insurance in their bid? And if so, would that have changed the um, ranking? Through you, Mr. Acting Bear, to Councillor Shoemaker, none of the um, people that bid on this put the builder's risk insurance on that because that was going to be done by the city. So they all put the bid in the same way and it would not have made a difference. Okay, perfect. Um, 
That's my only question on that matter. Mr. Acting Mayor. Anybody else on uh, 6.12? Councillor Shoemaker, you have another item? 6.6. Please proceed. Through you to Mr. Rumio. Um, concerning the underpass. Mr. Rumio, I realize this um, request is, is about uh, fees uh, for the the structural aspects of the underpass, but since it is on the agenda, I'm wondering if you could explain to us <clears throat> how after a uh, significant amount was spent on rehabilitation of the drainage system at the underpass, how it still uh, flooded a couple weeks ago. Mr. Ramil, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, through you, Acting Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker. There, as you say, there, there were no upgrades made to the underground drainage at the underpass under this project. Um, it was strictly a structural rehabilitation of the columns and concrete. So it, 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 it wasn't, there was nothing new underground. It was, it was the same underground infrastructure that, that was pre-existed prior to the contract. Thank you, Mr. Rumiel. Mr. Girardi, are you there? Uh, yes, I am, Councillor Shoemaker. Um, at the last meeting, maybe the meeting before that, you would talk to us about some repairs to the drainage at the underpass. Can you can you go through that? Square Absolutely. that Absolutely. To you, Ms. Uh, Mayor, Acting Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, uh, there was another component to this that Public Works had done. And uh, on the site, there was many catch basins and uh, uh, drain... Uh, drain pipes right at the surface that were damaged so some of the infrastructure was damaged so we did those repairs uh, and we did those repairs so that we can continue on to replace the road surface so we ground the road surface and replaced it so as far as the issue with flooding again on that day it's the volume of water so you got a volume of surface water coming down into a bowl well it's just like a funnel there's only so much that the system can take the infrastructure can take and the amount of vol the volume of water that was coming down was far beyond what the system could handle so uh, uh, so so regardless new pipes old pipes it was just too much water and correct it was just too much water for the system okay and uh, a Thank you, Mr. Mr. Girardi. On on the contents of the report more specifically, I think this is, I had asked Mr. Rumio this on the weekend, but perhaps uh, through uh, you, Mr. Acting Mayor, to the CAO, this is kind of one of those um, situations where it's, a, it's, a, it's an overrun and it's coming to us to approve it. But, you know, if we, if we denied it, we would most certainly be sued. So... <laughs> How, does it even make sense procedurally for us to have to approve it? it? Really, it should come to us as information, I would think, shouldn't it? Through you, uh, Mr. Acting Mayor to Councillor Shoemaker, uh, you do need to formally approve it uh, in order for us to uh, comply with uh, our purchasing bylaw and uh, other financial policies that we have in place. Uh, I do understand what you're saying. I think a lot of this will be improved in the future. Uh, there is the intent to uh, bring to council at some point this fall uh, a revised delegation bylaw, which will help uh, cure some of these uh, things that come to council either after the fact or uh, of a more minor nature. And uh, I think you'll see the system work a little better in that case. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. CAO. Is that it on 6.6 for you? Yes, I've, I've got one on 6.7, but you can help sure me. Sure, you there. do one moment, please. <laughs> Is there uh, anybody else on 6.6? Mr. Shoemaker, 6.7 you mentioned? Oh, I can't. can't That's right. There. Anybody else? Can we? Anybody else on anything else on consent? <laughs> Councilor Dufour. I, I believe the mayor's back now. Proceed, too. and then we'll, go, we'll circle okay. back to that. Um, just on 6.17, uh, it is a letter that the mayor made reference to in his comments um, dealing with recovery week. Um, I, I just wanted to add a few comments 
um, myself, if that's okay, Mr. Mayor. Absolutely, it is. It's on there. Go ahead. Thank you, Councilor Before. Yeah. So um, this letter, just for the benefit of, of those at home, is, is correspondence from from the mayor to uh, the Federal Minister of Families, Children and Social Development, as well as his Parliamentary Assistant on Homelessness. Um, where this letter comes from is from work that uh, has been undertaken by staff at Social Services and by the Mayor's Office. Um, and, and it really is, is to address the, the crisis that we're experiencing um, with homelessness and with drug addiction, especially as it pertains to uh, our experience living, working, and, and owning businesses downtown. Um, we've heard uh, various different media stories. Um, Councillor Fezzo Allen and I have heard plenty um, from, like I said, those who, who live and work downtown. Um, I, I just want to take this opportunity to echo what the mayor has said, that uh, we recognize that this is a problem. We recognize that we are in a state of crisis. Um, I think it would be accurate to say that a lot of the homelessness that we are seeing on the street today, um, much of it did pre-exist the pandemic, um, but it was hidden. Um, it was hidden with you know, folks um, couch hopping from basement to basement. It was hidden by um, certain people being uh, in, in jail and hospital beds. And now with COVID-19, um, it, it's come right to the surface. It's on our streets um, and it, it is upsetting. Um, and I think, um, you know, it's really important for us as leaders in the community to acknowledge that, um, to acknowledge that uh, what we're seeing is real. And I think it's also important to say that um, we're looking at this as an opportunity to not just slap a Band-Aid on the situation, but to really um, try to come up with a long-term sustainable solution to the problem that we're seeing so that um, even when the COVID-19 problem does go away, we've really made a difference for some of the most vulnerable members of our community because uh, as we're seeing downtown, um, these, these things affect us all from, from business owners to, to residents. So I'd just like to thank the mayor for uh, taking the time to write this letter. I'd like people to know that uh, a significant solution is in the works and we're hopeful that our federal partners will join us in, in helping to fund it. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's all. Thank you, Councilor Dufour. I appreciate you acknowledging those things, those challenges and issues, and I think it's important that people know we're working on them, so thank you. Uh, anybody else on uh, 6.17? Seeing none. Um, Councilor Gardy, did you have anybody else on the consent agenda here that wanted to speak to matters? Any, anything else on the consent agenda? Oh, Councilor Scott, we want to speak to Millennium Court, where Councillor Gardy has an interest, so he was conflicted. Go ahead, Councillor Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to I would think this would be going to Mr. Rumiel. Um, so just kind of for my own understanding and for some context here, uh, these types of ponds, um, do we have many of them in the city like many others? Do you have any other examples of these ponds that we have done, like undertaken as public works and engineering department? Uh, Mr. Rumiel, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, I didn't, I didn't catch much of that. Okay, so oh, sorry. I, I, let me uh, get closer to him. So sure. So what Councillor Scott is asking is, do we have many of these types of ponds or types of uh, pooling areas in the city? Is that accurate, Councillor Scott? Yep. Did, did you hear that, sure. Mr. Rumiel? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to, to Councillor Scott, we do have uh, stormwater retention ponds throughout the city, and most new newer developments. Um, some some bigger ones and larger subdivisions and some pretty small ones. To be honest, this this one wasn't originally designed uh, very well. It, it has been a problem for public works and, uh, and engineering for for years with erosion. There's just more flow than it was ever designed to handle. Um, it was this was Money Court, so it was before the turn of uh, the year 2000 when it was it was designed. But it. it uh, it, it has most of them are uh, much more efficient and better performing than that one. Great, that actually answered a couple of my other questions as well. Uh, and then just my final question, given that this work was mostly completed at the end of August, do we know now how it's looking two to three weeks after? So Mr. Mayor to Councillor Scott, I think you're asking what is the, the final cost gonna be? Or? 
Sorry, I didn't catch that. So what uh, Mr. Ramil said is he had, he believes you're asking what the final cost is going to be. Is that what? You're uh, no, just I'm curious to know how it's handling now that the work is done. Do we know that the work was done sufficiently? Is it in the clear? Like the the report just kind of says that most of the work was completed. Okay. So so how, uh, Mr. Ramil, are you able to comment on how things are going there, or if you're satisfied with how the work has been uh, handled and how the the if water is being if effectively channeled? Sure, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Scott. Um, we've, we've basically went away, completely away from the, the stormwater pond and just created a rock channel through the, uh, to the ravine. So from the, from the, the pipe coming out of uh, Millennium Court, it's, it's all just a blasted rock, um, large rock channel from one end to the other, and it stabilized the bank where the erosion was happening behind Fort Creek Drive. So yeah, from that point, it's, it's performing very well. Where we're at now is though that we have a C of A, uh, Certificate of Approval with Ministry, to, to maintain this water quality, which we're gonna have to address through future Capital Works projects, probably by installing a, uh, a, a oil grit separator upstream of the pipe. Which would which would handle the, uh, the the sediment removal of the from the storm sewer. So I guess we're not done this yet, but but it's it is uh, we, the properties are protected for the time being. We just have to, to deal with uh, abiding by our our C of A. Great, thank you. Uh, those are actually all of my questions on that item. I have Councillor Shoemaker and then Councillor Bruni on the same matter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my uh, comments are, 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 I don't have questions uh, because I've, I've dealt with this one for several months now. Um, and I, I'm familiar with the project. My comments are to staff uh, and they are to thank them because uh, properties on Fort Creek Drive that back onto this ravine, they're not exaggerating when they say they were falling into the ravine. I, I went to these properties and they were falling into the ravine. Uh, some of them uh, got, got uh, you know, what I would call perilously close uh, to losing their garages. Um, so, and it, and it was progressing faster, I think, than, than even our engineering department anticipated it would. So, nothing uh, at City Hall moves terribly quick um, when you want it to, except this uh, is the first thing, or one of the few things, I should say, that I've seen get done get resolved and get repaired uh, all you know within a couple of months of, of the issue being raised so so the nimbleness here uh, of on staff's part uh, was much appreciated not only by me as the council dealing with it but I know as from the neighbors both on Millennium Court um, where the out uh, fall is and on Fort Creek Drive where they were losing their backyards okay so next Councilor Bruni Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and question to Carl. Um, would the developer of, of this particular area be at fault for, for this, or who would be at fault? Through, Mr. through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Bruni, um, I, I don't think that uh, the flows that are actually coming through there are, are I think they're higher than you were anticipated for certainly than the, the pond was designed for. Um, I don't know what has happened between, you know, the mid 2000s and the mid 1990s. Uh, I don't know if there was other inputs there that contributed to that. So I, I kind of hesitate to say that there's somebody we could go back on, uh, but we certainly did did inherit this stormwater management plan that hasn't worked as it was intended to and has cost the city money. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions on this matter? Seeing none, I think that's it for the consent agenda, Madam Clerk, with the exception of 611, which we that's separated. Correct. I'm just gonna read the motion. The motion by Councillor Scott and Dufour resolved that all items listed under date September 14, 2020 agenda Item six, consent agenda saving except agenda item 6.11 be approved as recommended. All in favor? The motion is carried. 
That brings us to 6.11. Actually, yeah, 6.11. Uh, um, 6 it goes with um, the bylaw. It, but it does go with the bylaw. Okay. So the bylaw, Madam Clerk, is uh, that's what we'll be voting on. So the bylaws number. Uh, I'm just going to find that. I'm looking. It is bylaw 2020-171. Okay, so that's the, the matter that the vote will be on. You wanted this exempted, uh, Councillor? So did, uh, Scott, so did you want to speak to it? I would like to speak to it. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I've got some questions here um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Ms. Fields. Uh, so thank you for the report. I just have some questions regarding that. Uh, prior to the negotiations where we came up with the $350,000 price, um, did we get an appraisal on the property? Through you, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Scott, we did not get an appraisal on the property. We did take a look at what the impact value was. Uh, could, you, could you tell me what the impact value was? The impact value on the pieces were, and I don't have it right in front of me, but it was either 62000 or 69000 per property, and there's two properties. Okay, thank you. And um, I suppose the next question that I have, and I'm not sure who, would this, who this would go to, but uh, given that we're going to be potentially spending a, a premium on the property. Uh, do we have a proposed plan for what we're doing with this property? I don't know who that would go to. That's to the CAO. The CAO can answer that if he would like. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Scott, at this time we don't have specific plans for the property other than to purchase it and uh, hold on to it uh, long enough to remove the legal non-conforming use attached to the property. So I'll, yeah, maybe, maybe I, I just want to kind of give staff a bit of, of cover here because this wasn't something that I don't think staff initiated. Uh, the, the property owner reached out to the city and it was certainly something that uh, I could, I'm comfortable taking some responsibility for and really frankly asking council for its direction to engage in this and, and working with staff on it. So this wasn't a piece of property that staff identified and said we have to go out and buy. Uh, it was a piece of property that we had an opportunity to purchase uh, and to to essentially kind of take away a zoning in that property that uh, we don't want to see in that property any longer. So, you know, any questions as to kind of the motivation or what staff's plans are, <clears throat> you know, probably should be directed to me because this was, wasn't really something that staff was kind of motivated by or had any plans for. It was an opportunity that came to City Council to buy a piece of property and uh, remove the zoning on that piece of property. So for the next 50 years, when you drive over our bridge, the first thing that you see is not a strip bar. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, I have another question that might actually be for the CAO, but you may be able to answer it, Mr. Mayor. Um, historically, have we ever, as a city, purchased a property to remove a license or a zoning and essentially flip it back? Has that ever happened before? I, I wouldn't be able to answer. I, do, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Scott, I don't have an answer uh, immediately for that question. I'm not aware okay. of the time we've done it, uh, but uh, that's not to say it hasn't happened. Well, I, I would suggest at the beginning of the meeting, uh, former Mayor Irwin outlined purchasing a number of properties to change the use of what those properties were to a use that was more desirable for the city. So I think, uh, I think there were dozens of examples or, or near that at the beginning of our meeting. <laughs> we don't have the time. We don't, we don't have the time. We don't have the time. I, I, I do appreciate that comment. I, I also think that, that situation, they had a vision prior to the purchasing, but may, maybe he would have been able to shine some light on that. Maybe I'll corner him one day and ask him that question. Um, so that, that was mostly it for the questions. Uh, I'm just going to quickly, I don't have a lot written for, for speaking to it, but I just personally, uh, I don't find value uh, spending that kind of money to, to remove a, a zoning from a piece of property, um, even even if we could flip it for, for X amount, but we, it appears if MPAC, uh, and, and we could assume MPAC isn't going to exactly be the purchase price based on demand and market, but 
uh, it appears we would be overpaying quite significantly, um, and, and I personally don't feel comfortable uh, spending that sort of money, um, taxpayer money on that. Um, so that is why I asked for it to be pulled from consent, and I'm also asking for it to be a recorded vote, uh, if that's possible. All of our votes are recorded. I actually reached out to uh, the city clerk about this prior. She wasn't sure how it would work with a hybrid meeting. Yeah, you'll, you'll have to vote on your e-scribe. Okay, perfect. As long as it's recorded electronically, that and that counts. That's all I would like. Thank you. Uh, so we have Councillor Nero, and then I, I'm making a list here. <clears throat> Councillor Nero, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess the question would go to you. Um, Mr. Mayor, we're gonna, if we purchase this property this evening, uh, would it be true to say or would it be uh, fair to say that we may not do anything with this property, we may hold it, and we could end up selling it to recoup the cost? Absolutely. So if it's our property, there, there's, all, there's lots of options. Uh, you know, there's a lot of development in that area. We have, you know, a local business person investing significant sums and improving the whole mill market area. Uh, you know, uh, uh, talk to Public Works about that piece of property. Public Works thinks it's a piece of, an attractive piece of property for us to own for a number of reasons outside of assets and property we own in the area, you know, proximity to Bay Street. So we, we, there is no specific plan for it yet. But it was determined, staff, when, when the opportunity came to us and we discussed it, staff looked at it and thought it was a good piece of property for our inventory. It is something that we might well be able to flip, and if somebody was interested in the property, and I say this publicly, and I say this to any developers in our community, and I say this to anybody who might be looking at doing something in that, pro in that neighborhood, if someone's interested in the property, they could certainly approach us about it. We'd be open to it, but we have no specific designs on it. Uh, but a, the general feeling was it was a good property to own. And, we, and we're... we're confident that we could uh, at one point if we don't use it for our own purposes that we could recoup the 350,000 I, I don't know what the market will bear you depending know, on like, what the market is I, I, I would agree that uh, we're paying a, a premium for the property um, you know I don't I don't think it's a significant premium as the differentiation between the impact assessment and what we're paying for it but so I, I don't know what the market will bear right now I don't know what the market will bear like when we decide to sell it if we decide to sell it uh, but I still think it's the right decision to make and there's value there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My only uh, question was to Public Works. Um, I drive by uh, the, the bridge fairly regularly and the, the property is unkept. I realize it's vacant, but it's got, it kind of looks unkept. I'm wondering if we can get a commitment from Public Works to level it off or clean it off. And, you know, make it look a little more appealing, uh, at least until we figure out what we're going to do with it. Well, uh, Public Works can speak to that. Mr. Girardi, are you still on the line? Uh, yes, I am, Mr. Mayor. So through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Shoemaker, I mean, this is not a normal practice, uh, but as this property is close proximity to the Bridge Plaza, it would be appropriate for us to seed and a portion and possibly plant a few trees to make it look uh, more aesthetically pleasing for when people are coming off the bridge. Uh, so if purchased, I'll have Parks Division make some improvements to it. Perfect. Thank you. Councillor Gardy. I'll, uh, I'm going to be real quick. Um, I, I'm glad Councillor Shoemaker asked that question because I noticed the same sort of thing, so that would be great should uh, this go through that, that uh, property is restored a bit. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to differ with my ward mate on, on, on this. Um, personally, I believe that this is a wise decision. I am confident in probably stating that a vast majority of the community do, does not want an establishment like that one located where it is. It's, uh, how can I say this nicely, if I can? Um, I think you said it. It's timely, it, 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 it's time for that building, um, you know, it's time for that property not to, to house that type of establishment. It is my personal opinion that establishments such as those are places where nothing really good takes place for a community. And I am glad to see it go. And um, I'm uh, going to be voting to support. Thank you. Councilor Bruni. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just, I think a question to legal. Um, in the report, it said in January 2020, the license for Studio 10 expired. So, when, so with that statement, would they be able to reapply, or is it completely expired that 
they wouldn't be able to apply for a license. <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bruni, he, if he had not sold the property, do you mean, could he reply? If the current owner continues to own the property and the property has the zoning it does, could the, the owner reapply for the license? There has to be, uh, sorry, there has to be a property, like there has to be a building on the property to get a license. So he couldn't get a license without a building being placed back on it. So he would have to build a building to get his license back. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess a quick comment. I, I do uh, agree with Councillor Scott, um, but I do also agree with the other councillors regarding it was an eyesore. Um, uh, I think we've paid a little bit too much for it, and I've stated that earlier uh, to the council members, but uh, under the circumstances, I think we had no choice, and uh, we'll move on with this. And hopefully, there's somebody out there that wants to purchase that property for $350,000. Okay, Councilor Dufour. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just uh, I wanted to kind of push back a little bit on, on, on the initial question there about um, there being a vision for this property in this area. And uh, though, uh, you know, you started to highlight some of it that, you know, there is no um, specific plan for this exact piece of property. Uh, I just want the public to really understand that there absolutely is a vision for this area. This area, um, we have a Jamestown revitalization strategy coming. Um, this piece of property is a part of that. We have a significant development that's occurred on, on Mr. Porco's property at, at the mill market. We've extended the hub trail to this area. We have an opportunity to extend it further um, in the years to come, which will go by this area. We are relocating our transit shelter to this area. We are, <laughs> we've approved uh, you know, a potential gateway development and condo development to this area. Uh, the federal government has spent a great deal of money on the canal, which is also adjacent to this area. So uh, there is a, a significant amount of partners um, joined with the city that, that have a vested, um, committed financial, uh, financial investment into the success of this area and into the vision that I think the city um, rightfully deserves credit for, for starting to initiate, uh, especially beginning with the reconstruction of Bay Street um, and, and with the dollars that we've committed um, towards beautifying our waterfront. Uh, I, I was inspired listening to Mr. Irwin talk about uh, how some of that waterfront vision first came about early on in our history of the city. And, uh, and you know, it was very telling listening to some of the stories of what, what the opposition looked like at the time. And, and, and to hear how he pushed through that was inspiring. And, and I'm very much reminded of it as we discuss this property. So um, I'm wholeheartedly in support of it. And thank you, Mr. Mayor, for bringing this to council. Thank you, Councilor Dufour. Councilor Vezo Allen. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. Just more of a, a comment of my support of this project. Uh, I totally echo my ward mate, uh, Councilor Dufour, that it enhances all the other projects and initiatives that are happening in that area. And while you take a look at $350,000 and the impact value, um, for anyone who's bought a house recently, um, take a look at what your impact value is and what your purchase price was. So, you know, impact value and market value are two completely opposite um, things in today's market. And I think most certainly, um, if we're concerned about recouping our investment, I think it's, it's money well spent. I think we will um, most certainly be able to recoup some of that investment through, whether it's Mr. Porco or another private investor, and also hopefully keep some of that property so that it does link um, our James Street revitalization area to that uh, core area. And that's been one of the biggest issues that we discuss around the table about James Street is that they feel that they're disconnected. So this connects that our community and I support it and I wanna thank um, all the hard work that's been done in, in negotiating this deal. Thank you, Councillor Christian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I oppose the purchase price um, before. I think it's a. I think it's a very good uh, idea to purchase the property for the reasons that you stated. Um, <clears throat> I'm not convinced that 
we have a uh, we we may have a vision, but but we really need to develop the plans. I think the price we pay, paid for this property is high. <clears throat> I agree, we needed to buy it, but I think we could have negotiated a lower price. And to say that we're um, you know trying to improve the area. Uh, if, if that's our goal, then there are several other properties that need to be purchased as well because that's one of many in that area. So I wouldn't pat ourselves too, uh, too well hard on the back because really this was about purchasing property to eliminate that designation for the property. At least that's my opinion. So um, I agree we needed to buy it for the reasons cited, but I still think we paid a little too much. Thank you. So... So I'll just I'll offer a, fi a few final comments. I don't want to repeat anything that any of my colleagues have said. I agree wholeheartedly with everything Councilor Dufour said. Uh, and I, th I think it's important, though, that we, we be uh, mindful of making our own commitments in areas of our community that need to see us uh, invest in them. And this is an area of the city that we all recognize needs our time and our care and our investment. And I think uh, removing the designation is certainly uh, a motivating factor, but I think it's, it's a lot broader than that. And uh, I think that there are a lot of other positives that come from this. I think history will look back at this decision as a wise one, and uh, we'll look back on it favorably. And uh, I've already acknowledged that I think, uh, you know, we're paying probably a little more than, than market value, but I think there's value in that, and uh, that's what we could get the property for. And I think we're doing our community a good turn here, and I'm happy to be part of it, and I'm happy to do it. And the vote is up. Madam uh, Clerk, have you read the resolution? I have not yet. It's nice to see Councillor Hillsinger. Councillor Hillsinger, it's nice to see you. I should tell the community that you have been involved in the entire meeting, just not on video. So, so you have been here with us. But it's nice to see you present. Yes. I don't know if yes, you want... Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have been here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the, the vote's up, but uh, the clerk will read the resolution and then we'll... So we'll, motion we'll, by we'll, Councillors Gardy and Dufer resolved that bylaw 2020-171 being a bylaw to authorize the acquisition of property located at 89 Hudson Street, 598096 Ontario Limited, Trahan. All in favour? Opposed? So carry 10 to 1. And because it's 9.30... We will need to do a motion to extend beyond five hours. Did you want to? So I have a resolution by Councillors Gardy and Dufer resolved that the rules of procedure be suspended to permit this meeting to extend beyond five hours. All in favor? Motion carried. Okay, so we then, Madam Clerk, are we're going on mo we're on we're on council motions. Uh, no, we are actually before that. We've got one oh. on regular, which is seven point six point one insurance requirements for patios. Oh, that's it's, right. It's a motion by Councillor Scott and Vezo Allen, resolved that the report of the city solicitor and risk manager dated September 14, 2020, concerning insurance requirements for patios be received and that liability insurance requirements be maintained at $2 million for unlicensed patios and $5 million for licensed patios. Okay, so do we have, uh, we're gonna start with Councillor Vezo Allen uh, and uh, she was one of the members for this. I will be brief. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Ms. Fields, um, thank you very much for the report and, and Adam's work as well in the risk management. Um, in terms of your report, what you quote is licensed patios on city properties requiring the five million. Can you explain further as to patios that are licensed that are not on city property? Because that isn't really referred to in the report. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Besso Allen, if there is property that, or a patio that's on, not on city property, we wouldn't have any uh, interest in that. That would be somebody's own private property to run their business. It's only when they're using our, um, for example, our sidewalks 
to put up their commercial, um, to carry on commercial purposes, that's when it impacts the city. Thank you, Ms. Fields. And perhaps uh, Mr. McConnell, if he's still on the line. Mr. McConnell, do you know how many property, how many patios we have that are encroached on city property currently? Is Mr. McConnell, you directed that to Mr. McConnell. Yeah. Mr. McConnell, are you still on the line? He is not. He's not. No. Um, so Ms. Fields, I would just from doing, thinking about, really thinking mainly people that are downtown that are on city property. So let's say there's half a dozen for argument's sake. Um, do you know or are you aware of any um, circumstances that have happened to create an incident where there was an issue that went to lit litigation Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Vezo Allen, I'm not aware of um, incidents in the city where anything has happened. I mean, I would know about it if it had happened, so I'm going to say there hasn't been any incident that's been brought to our attention. They do have two years uh, to bring a claim, and uh, we haven't been put on notice for anything. Okay. Regarding, um, so when someone has a licensed patio, it's licensed through the Alcohol Gaming Commission of Ontario, and it is the licensee's responsibility to serve responsibly. Um, so I did some investigation through AGCO. Um, they have a PDF doc, liability, there's more to lose than your license, and they highlight um, certain in instances where there has been litigation in terms of over-serving. And the amounts range from 400,000, 88,000, 93,000, 124,000. Um, the most, um, the, the highest one that they um, highlight is 1.75 million. So my argument is, is that if we don't have the data or the, the instances in the past to warrant that 5 million, I think in terms of the longevity of our patio season, what we're trying to do to assist with businesses during during COVID, the decrease in their seating capacity. I think from what we see both during um, this report from AGCO that they have licensees, the fact that licensees are required to follow um, codes through AGCO and have smart serve and not over serve. Um, the fact that the majority of our patios that encroach city property are mostly food um, focus. So you take a look at, you know, East Street Pizza or Low and Slow, um, Arturo's, that food is their primary um, item, not um, sitting there just to drink alcohol. So I, um, I respect your report, but I do believe from both um, the data that I've seen on AGCO and what we see our neighboring community of Sudbury rely on two million, that I think two million um, liability is sufficient for our encroached city property patios. Okay, so we have Councillor Shoemaker next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to move to amend the, the recommendation to, okay. uh, to uh, require that licensed patios only have two million dollars of liability insurance. Okay, so we have a seconder for that, Councillor Dufour. Okay, so now we're on the amendment. So would you like to speak to the amendment, Councillor? I, I think Mayor? that Councillor Vezoal and basically captured uh, my thoughts on this, and, and that is what I will use in support of my amendment. Well, I do have a question okay. with respect to the, uh, the amendment. I'm wondering if it makes sense to maintain the unlicensed number at one uh, two million one license number is, is uh, get now going to be two million, uh, but perhaps uh, I can canvas that well, separately. You, you've amended it to do that, right? So like the, the, the amendment is, is to, to keep them all at two million. Yes, and, and I guess perhaps to, to Ms. Fields, would it make sense to lower the unlicensed uh, patio requirement? I, uh, through you, Councillor, or Mr. Mayor, to Councillor um, Shoemaker, I appreciate that um, you know, we're trying to assist businesses in the community, especially during this time of COVID. Um, our recommendations are based on sort of a history of food service, um, alcohol serving, 
uh, just the industry uh, in general, the fact that they will, all these businesses will take on an occupier's um, obligation under the uh, the Act. And so our recommendation is to keep it at the two. I mean, we will take your instructions, obviously, but that's what we are looking at from other communities as well as our insurer. Okay. The two across the board then would, I would maintain that uh, amendment. Okay. Council Dufour, I'm going to go to you next because you seconded that amendment. Did you want to speak to the amendment? Uh, I would just, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm okay, so the motion before us is amended. Any any questions of the main motion as amended? Seeing none, all in favor of the main motion as amended. Motion is carried. Okay. So that brings us to council resolutions. Yes, it does. <clears throat> Under agenda item 8.1, assistance for regional community airports, a motion by councillors Shoemaker and Gardy, whereas regional community airports are of strategic national importance and play an essential role in Canada's air transportation sector, providing vital services and connecting remote communities with the rest of the country and the world. And whereas regional community airports like the Sault Ste. Marie Airport are part of a larger multimodal transportation system, maintaining trade and the flow of goods and providing life-saving access to emergency transport through medevac services. And whereas regional community airports provide a public benefit that extends far beyond the communities in which they are located and are critical to the overall social and economic health and well-being of local communities. And whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly impacted the aviation industry, resulting in dramatic reductions in revenue for regional airport operations. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City of Sault Ste. Marie requests that the federal and provincial governments provide regional community airports with financial assistance needed to ensure their continued operation until domestic transporter and international travel resumes and the industry recovers. Council Shoemaker? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this was brought uh, to my attention by our, our airport, uh, who asked uh, if we could put something akin to this on our agenda. Other Northern Ontario municipalities have passed a similar airport, sort of specific to their, or sorry, have passed it, it's getting late, have passed a specific motion uh, specific to their airport. Um, but I just want to read some stats that I was sent by the airport. So the airport uh, has lost $3.3 million over the course of the COVID pandemic. Um, it has uh, dropped from 214,000 passengers last year to less than 65,000 so far this year. Uh, recovery is not expected to hit the levels of 2019, the levels they were at in 2019 until 2024. So they're looking at four more years of decreased revenue. And as a result of the cutbacks uh, from uh, uh, their, their loss of revenue, they have uh, reduced their staffing levels 45% or 8.5 full-time positions. So uh, obviously a, a big impact for our airport. Our airport, everyone, everyone who, who uses it knows it's our, it's our lifeline to the rest of the world, right? You can get anywhere in the world by flying Sault Ste. Marie to Toronto, Toronto to wherever you want to go. Um, and with the, the competition we've had here in town between Porter, Air Canada, and Bearskin Airlines, uh, prices have been reasonable over the last six, seven, eight years, uh, and it's meant uh, greater, uh, cho and we've even had Sunwing flying directly from Sault Ste. Marie to, uh, to Caribbean destinations. So uh, it, is, uh, it is a resource we need in order to be able to connect to the world outside our are not just our municipal borders, but outside our national borders. So obviously I think we all would agree that uh, our airport needs help and uh, that we should support it in whatever help they are seeking. Okay. Do uh, we have any other comments in that motion? I think it will probably receive unanimous support. Can we have a vote on it? All in favor? 
Motion is carried. And under agenda item 8.2, a motion by Councillors Shoemaker and Christian, whereas the provincial government in the city of Sault Ste. Marie had previously offered grants to homeowners who wanted to make improvements to their residences and such program was extremely successful. And whereas it is in the interest of the city of Sault Ste. Marie for homes to be well maintained and updated. And whereas many individuals across Ontario, including in Sault Ste. Marie, live on a fixed income and have difficulty finding the resources to make upgrades to their residences. Now therefore be it resolved that the planning department review the historic success of the Provincial Municipal Grant Program and report and make recommendations on whether funds are available from a provincial or municipal source to assist those on fixed incomes with the upgrading and maintenance of their homes. Mr. Shoemaker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This uh, motion uh, stems from a discussion with our planning staff on, uh, on different methods uh, of assistance that have worked in the past to either maintain or improve on assessment in various areas uh, of town where there is declining or stagnant assessment. Uh, uh, back uh, when this program was in place in the 1980s, uh, Mr. McConnell uh, advises that the uh, uptake in the Bayview area in specific was very high and resulted in many new uh, exterior facade improvements, uh, front porches uh, in being improved, landscaping, uh, general uh, you know, beautification of the neighborhoods there. So uh, just looking to see if there's any resources available uh, from upper levels of government and if not, whether or not planning thinks that we should uh, create uh, such a program on our own. Okay. Do we have any other comments on this motion? Seeing none, we can have a vote on the motion. All in favor? Motion is carried. The next motion is just a notice of motion because it was put on the agenda uh, late and uh, there's no seconder as of yet. Uh, so Councillor Shoemaker's notice of motion will be read and dealt with at the next meeting. Clerk. Whereas in February 2018, Council approved a rezoning for a new Pino's grocery store on Great Northern Road. And whereas as part of that rezoning approval, Council approved a traffic light to be installed at a to be constructed entrance to Pino's adjacent to the Walmart laneway just north of Superior Home Bakery. And whereas businesses in the immediate vicinity of the proposed intersection were concerned about the ability of their clients and customers to get in and out of their premises, and whereas a potential solution to the access issue for those businesses would be for Walmart to grant them access to their laneway that would be controlled by a traffic signal. And whereas construction has begun on the installation of the traffic signals, but in agreements have not yet been reached between businesses that abut Walmart's laneway and Walmart for access to the Walmart laneway, and Walmart has been difficult to communicate with on the issue, ignoring various outreaches and correspondence. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Council direct that installation of traffic signals at the new intersection be paused until such time as agreements are reached or progress has been made on negotiations of such agreements between neighbouring businesses and Walmart for access to their laneway. Further, be it resolved that staff continue to make efforts to reach out to Walmart to facilitate the negotiations for said access, as they've been attempted to do for quite some time. <clears throat> and then we've moved to bylaws. That is correct. So I've got a consent motion um, by Councillor Scott and Vezo Allen resolved that all bylaws under item 11 of the agenda dated September 14, 2020, save and accept bylaws 202164, 202171, and 202175 be approved. All in favor? Carried. And 202164 is accepted uh, on account of Councillor Shoemaker's uh, conflict. So it's a Motion by Councillors Gardy and Dufour resolved that bylaw 2021-64 being a bylaw to authorize the acquisition of property located abutting the gateway site, Algoma Central Railway, be passed in open council this 14th day of September 2020. And that's open. All in favor? Carried.
and bylaw 2021-75, also as a result of uh, Councillor Shoemaker's conflict. A motion by Councillors Gardy and Dufour resolved that bylaw 2021-75 being a bylaw to amend Sault Ste. Marie zoning bylaws 2005-150 and 2005-151 concerning lands located at 1765 Great Northern Road be passed in open council this 14th day of September 2020. All in favor? Carried. And a motion by Councillors Gardy and Dufour resolved that this council move into closed session to discuss two proposed acquisitions or dispositions of land and one item subject to third party confidentiality. Further be it resolved that should the said closed session be adjourned, the council may reconvene in closed session to continue to discuss the same matters without the need for a further authorizing resolution. All in favor? Carried. And a motion by Councillors Guardian and Dufour that this council now adjourn. All in favor? Carried. So we do have some closed items, Council. 